Okay, welcome everybody to another Sunday session. Uh, we're back after about a two week break. And uh, obviously, uh, I say this every single time, uh, always a fun time in oil and gas markets, uh, not just intra month, but also intra week and intraday. We're seeing some uh, interesting price movements up and down uh, that maybe are not correlating to some of the EI reports and uh, some of the other data. Uh, but on the overall, it looks like we're in this in this band uh, per se between 73 and 80 WTI. We had a shot to go above 80 uh, there a couple of weeks ago. And then uh, the Biden administration again came out with a comment that uh, they will release the 26 million of SPR that was scheduled uh, for this year. So uh, there was some comments at one point that uh, possibly with the House being Republican, uh, that would uh, be delayed or canceled. Um, not the case. So uh, I guess we'll we'll see that coming on the market. Of course, a far cry from the 200 plus million barrels that was released uh, in 2022. So uh, anyways, interesting times. Uh, I've spent the last couple of weeks kind of just uh, catching up on uh, overall macro, uh, redoing some of the uh, website, call it, uh, changing up some of the uh, 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 things on there. And uh, also, I actually spent, spent amongst other things, I spent the last couple of weeks chatting with a few individuals who have been following this for a um, year and a half or so now, and just got some feedback from them, got some suggestions. And uh, one thing I was really kind of, uh, I guess, excited to hear is uh, sounds like people are a fan of the long format sort of content. Uh, I know it it gets maybe a bit much for people who have families, you got kids, you got events, other stuff happening. But I do think the the oil and gas industry is not one you can learn in 30 minutes, uh, especially people who are serious uh, about understanding macro, about understanding engineering, understanding these companies. Uh, you really have to put in the time. And uh, part of the reason why you see portfolios with either 0% energy or very high percentage uh, allocation to energy, just because of the time it takes to be uh, to have that conviction in sort of the thesis and uh, where we are right now. So, um, yeah. So I'm going to continue making these these longer format uh, uh, kind of videos. Uh, I enjoy making them too. I think the depth of detail is required, and they're always there on the internet. So if somebody has to um, or or w wishes to view them over a multi-day, multi-period uh, sort of period. That kind of works, right? It's it's better to have the content out there because I think oil and gas is very opaque uh, in in various kind of parts of the the industry. So, yeah. So that was the one learning. Uh, the other learning, I guess, was uh, there. There's an interest in knowing more about uh, sort of how things work in the exact oil patch, and one of the ways that I find is easiest for me to share and for possibly viewers to relate to is uh, me sharing my own pictures. So from the time that I used to work in the patch, uh, of course, I've got uh, three or four years of pictures and, and videos and other things uh, that are easy to explain because I literally worked uh, on those that I'm, that I'm going to be describing. So there's a few that I will share today, and I hope to kind of pepper them in uh, throughout uh, not just the uh, today's session, but also other sessions, because we have obviously a, a change in sort of uh, the presentation schedule, it's gone from 2022 being valuation focused uh, on companies to 2023 being more macro factors, uh, call it, uh, you know, global um, supply, uh, demand, some petroleum engineering topics, uh, change it up a bit. We're, we're still going to have some valuation videos, of course, in there, but um, shifting the focus a bit now that we've discussed a lot of companies uh, in detail. And uh, as I'd mentioned earlier, I'm still planning to do either a monthly or a quarterly uh, overall update on every single company. So probably a three to four hour session where we talk about latest updates. Uh, I think a good time to do it is after the Q4s are all released. So uh, keep an eye out for that. So um, anyway, uh, I kind of digress in here. So to start, a few things I did want to say up front. I'm not an investment advisor, so please uh, don't take anything here as financial advice. If you do need uh, to to take financial advice, there is uh, lots of financial advisors out there. So please, uh, you can book an, uh, an appointment with any of them, whoever you trust, uh, and kind of go from there. Uh, please do your own due diligence. What I share today is my opinion. Uh, it's things that I've learned, uh, things that I would like to share. 
uh, but it is everything that is coming from my uh, side as an opinion. So uh, please check everything uh, and do your own due diligence on these topics. Uh, please also check your risk tolerance. Oil and gas is a very volatile industry to begin with. Uh, these days, seems like it's getting more and more volatile. Uh, so there's a specific risk tolerance around that. Uh, and, and with the risk tolerance comes investment time frame. So depending on what exactly you're doing over the short term, medium term, long term, uh, you'll have to make a decision on that, uh, whether you invest in the sector to begin with and what sort of investments fit your mandate. Uh, and then the third thing, uh, please check your portfolio construction. The things I share today uh, are based on my look at things. I have a different portfolio construction. It is a margin portfolio. I do use the uh, options as well. I also invest in junior companies. So there's a different uh, portfolio construction that may work for me that may or may not work for you. So uh, please keep that in mind when you're listening to uh, the things today. Um, another point up front, I do have a mailing list. So uh, all I send is the invites to the Zoom links one or two days earlier. Uh, usually I would like to send the files as well. Uh, but but so far, I have not been able to get the files fully finalized uh, when I want to send the, the Zoom link out. So unfortunately, there's a gap there, but uh, that is a um, something I plan in the future. So if you do want to join that list, uh, please DM me or shoot me an email uh, and we can get you on there. Uh, the Zoom is recorded. The Twitter space is recorded. The Zoom will be on YouTube shortly here later today. Uh, Twitter, of course, will record it right, uh, right away. Um, and then, yeah, we're going to have a Q&A at the end. Today's uh, seminar is kind of uh, a different one. It's it's on enhanced oil recovery and other methods to increase recovery factor. So we're going to be bouncing a little bit over the place. Uh, I do also wish to talk about basics of the oil patch. So what is a pump jack? How do we get oil out of the ground? These, these sorts of topics, uh, which I think need to be understood before we talk about enhanced oil recovery and where we're going from there. So. Uh, we'll we'll discuss a bit on that. I'm going to start off with five or six slides on macro uh, things I want to discuss over the last three weeks, and then uh, looking forward, uh, we'll talk about the uh, basics of the the oil and gas world. Then we'll talk about enhanced oil recovery, uh, and then we'll end it with a Q and A session. Uh, I do apologize to anybody on Twitter. We can take questions just the way the audio recording works. So uh, if you do have a question, please uh, join the Zoom, uh, which I will say is at whitetundra.ca. If you scroll to the bottom under events, uh, the Zoom link is on there uh, and you can uh, join in for the visuals. Uh, if not, Twitter space will continue recording the audio uh, going forward. So yeah, I think with that, let's uh, let's get started here. So uh, enhanced oil recovery 101. Uh, so few few points in supply demand up front. Uh, I do want to make these points. I think they're, they're quite important. So uh, Chinese uh, flights. I've discussed this as one of the proxies to watch going forward. The domestic travel has sort of flatlined right now at, at this point. Uh, the international travel is still picking up. So about three or four days ago, we hit 1,500 international flights, which is higher than any point since uh, March of 2020. So a good sign that uh, the final frontier, which was China allowing international travels coming in, and the rest of the world allowing the Chinese travelers uh, internationally is reopening. Uh, I've discussed this very, very much in detail uh, in, in other spaces and uh, throughout my Twitter feed. So uh, please check that out. But but this is one that I think is a very important factor to track uh, going forward. So, so looking pretty good right now. We're having a seasonal uh, March or February slowdown. The global jet fuel industry picks up March 1st, March 15th, and then March 26th, when they switch to the IATA summer schedule uh, of flights, it opens up more flight availability at airports, at airlines. Uh, so a kind of date to watch uh, going forward. The other one is Hong Kong. So pre-COVID Hong Kong airport was the most busiest airport in Asia. So this airport, singular airport is a hub for business. Uh, Asian business between countries uh, for manufacturing, for transportation, for uh, business conferences, travel, etc. So looking to see some opening here uh, with, with not just China, but with other countries, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines, uh, restarting flights back to uh, uh, Hong Kong. And of course, once that starts up, 
there will be a impact of that based on what people are discussing in Hong Kong, right? It is a, it's a process. Okay. Things are opened. Now Chinese domestic uh, tourists and travelers are going all over the place. Uh, international people are going to Hong Kong over there. They meet the Asian business community. They make deals. And then in a month or two or three, there's, there's a going to be different lag depending on what industry we're talking about. Those things then restart. So whether it's restarting of automobiles, whether it's uh, a conference, uh, whether it's a uh, property development, those things are restarting. We need to get people face to face, no matter what people say, business is conducted in person. You can do this remote thing, the Zoom thing, it works. It works quite successfully in certain things. Uh, but when you're talking about large scale, long-term contracts uh, being signed, that business is done over a handshake. And for that, Hong Kong is the place to be. So uh, watching uh, this number very closely as well. Um, of course, I've got the daily tracking on this happening. So uh, looking forward to kind of uh, how this goes up and, and share more as time goes on. Uh, the other one on the supply side. So we talked about demand. Now we'll talk about supply. So the number of counties in US with an active horizontal drilling rig. This had jumped up to about 92 counties in September, October. Prices were still looking good. You know, we were down from 120, but it was still 95, 90. And what, what did producers do? Private producers and those with fringe acreage started increasing rig counts in the, call it marginal counties. So you saw the number of counties with the rig started jumping from 80 to about 92. And guess what? Now it's down to 78 in a matter of three or four months. And this is when I make the point that the SPR has been very effective, but it's had long-term consequences on the second order and third order impacts, which are not being felt right away. There's a lag on that. Once again, you know, if a rig is dropped in November, okay, well, in the, in the short term, there's a very little difference, but over a six to 12 month period, that dropped rig and the uh, supply that would have brought on is going to be felt in the market in not just supply, but the inventory that kind of cumulatively adds up of what that rig could have produced, uh, of course, after the frack. So uh, keeping an eye out on this, we're seeing inventory exhaustion in some of the major producers. Uh, and then some of the private producers are completely zeroed out. They have no inventory that's, uh, uh, I call it economic, below $100, $120 a barrel. So this is the legit state of the industry. I talked about this in my uh, January 29th macro uh, shale update. So uh, some of the companies I showed with maps why that's the case. So uh, we'll continue to track this going forward uh, and see kind of how it goes uh, because U.S. shale was the supply from 2015 to 2020. And if they're now dropping rigs, the active counties are going down. The frac spread is down 18 year over year. There's going to be an impact in 2023 especially in an era of high inflation and declining well productivity. Uh, this point is further made when you look at uh, Lee County, the most productive county in the Permian Basin, we're seeing rigs down from about 67 rigs to 55 rigs in just a matter of four, four or five months. So, you know, companies hydrated their acreage throughout 2021 and 2022, and now they're running out of steam in these high powered uh, call it counties. The same is happening in Midland Basin, which is one of the most productive counties on the Midland part uh, of the Permian. And you're seeing rigs pick up in other lower productive uh, parts of the of the Permian Basin. So what does it mean? That means on a rig per rig basis, if if you had 500 rigs working before in oil, now you got 500 rigs, but but they're drilling less productive land to begin with, um, and the ones that are in the same productive land are now suffering from per well productivity. You can see how there's a compounding effect as to what happens and why there are, there are some reasonable chances that US production actually could decline when we look at December, 2023 uh, compared to, so, so December, 2022 had a, had a big weather event. So it's not fair to compare that, but maybe December, 2023 to November, 2022, when we look at just shale production, uh, there's a reasonable chance that that it does decline. When we look at overall U.S. production, I guess the jury is still out. But I think as the data comes in, uh, we'll get really good clarity as to as to where the trajectory uh, is going. 
Um, okay, so there's a couple questions here. Um, yeah, so so please, um, I did talk about the Chinese flights. Um, the international flights, yes, are picking up. Uh, I don't have the exact number here, but uh, I will be sharing that on my feed uh, in the next few days here as I see that continued tick. Uh, I'm waiting for March 1st when there's a big increase in uh, future flights. Uh, but I did talk about that um, um, earlier as well. What are the total rig numbers? Uh, okay, so... This is an interesting comment, and I I don't really want to get into it right now. But um, it sounds like the rig the rig availability is pretty maxed out. Any extra rig is either cold stacked or uh, the OFS companies are just not going to bring it back online uh, unless they get paid big money, which is not being paid right now. So so it's effectively a stalemate uh, at this point. A cold stacked rig is going to take many months before it can be actually brought back into service. So there is now. Now, when I, when I say there's a lag on the bullish side, there's also a lag on the bearish side uh, by the time these rigs can come online uh, uh, to help a supply as well. So, okay, here is uh, what we need to watch. I discussed this in a few of the spaces, offshore, deep water, or even, even the regular water uh, offshore is going to be the new supply going forward. Uh, when we look at sources of supply that are meaningful, um, that that sort of can make a difference uh, in a global scale at a lower decline rate. So this is Johans up. That's literally the entire field right there. 720,000 barrels per day. This was a huge find by the Lundin family in early 2010s. Uh, they later sold it. It kind of went through a bunch of phases. Uh, and in the end, I believe Equinor is the operator now. But think about that, 720,000 barrels per day is what it produces. This was one of the last sort of remaining hidden uh, fields in the lower uh, North Sea portion of, uh, off the coast of Norway uh, that was discovered. Very, very nice field. Uh, it was able to increase production, of course, over a decade period. So once again, keep in mind, from discovery to max production offshore could be a decade or more. Uh, so so anybody talking about these the supply needs to take that into account and a very state-of-the-art system. Uh, just want to show this as a source of, uh, of supply that has actually come online over the last year or two period. So, um, you know, despite global supply being still quite hampered, uh, keep in mind th that is with platforms like this coming online and the global supply is still flatlining. So that goes to show you the decline, the legacy declines in the other parts of the industry that are maybe being masked uh, uh, by by platforms like this, which are again one of a kind, they are not easily uh, found to this level by any means at all uh, these days. And um, yeah, pretty cool stuff actually going on here. Uh, uh, if anybody's looking at kind of state of the art uh, offshore installations, uh, there's some cool articles on this uh, online. So what's happening right now? There's a million barrels per day offline as of February twentieth. Uh, half of that is because of the West Quran, a Kurna 2 oil field uh, in Iraq that is down for about 10 to 12 days for maintenance. This is a yearly maintenance that happens. It happened last year for 14 to 16 days. Uh, this year, they're saying 10 to 12 days. Uh, so there's, there's this. Um, and then there is the Ecuador issue that happened uh, where they discovered a, a bridge collapse <laughs> that happened. This is the pipeline hanging. That's right. This is a 300,000 barrel per day pipeline hanging here. Uh, they got very lucky that this did not break uh, or collapse here under its own weight uh, because this bridge is, is entirely gone, as you can see, based on the landslide. Uh, Ecuador had problems with this last year as well. Uh, culverts collapsing and um, uh, spills in the pipeline. Of course, very sensitive environmentally area, uh, a very environmentally sensitive area that you have here. And it sounds like about 450,000 barrels per day is going to be down at least a week up to three weeks. So again, these things don't make a massive difference on the thesis. But when people ask, why did oil price rise on Thursday and Friday? Well, some of this news came out and now we know, okay, it's going to be down at least a week, maybe three weeks. Uh, and, it, and it continues to show that Ecuador has not fixed the problem. It's still a consistent uh, issue that could come back at any time, even right now. I mean, 
if this had 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 ruptured and broken, that would be a pretty long downtime that they would have to have to uh, had to dealt uh, deal with. So they got lucky this time. May not get so lucky next time. So West Corona two and Ecuador million barrels per day down right now for the next uh, still probably week or so, uh, and then the slow gradual uh, ramp up after that. Uh, on the refining side, Kuwait's Al Zur refinery uh, has started now, 615,000 barrels per day, uh, giving support to the refining market. And we see that not just because the refinery is online, because they're actually sending shipments into Fujara in UAE. And we can track all these things that give us an idea of, of where we are in terms of global refining, which was a big bottleneck last year. Looks like possibly still a bottleneck this year, but not to the same extent. And hopefully as U.S. refineries come out of maintenance season here in the next two to three weeks, we're off to the races um, on, on that side of things. And it's not a headwind uh, to, to crude oil price uh, like it was last year. Okay, so um, yeah, wow. Wow is definitely right. Yeah, when I saw this picture, I said, man, they got lucky like this. There's two pipelines here, it looks like, and the bridge is completely gone. Um, there is no support. And, and think about the weight on the pipeline, uh, uh, you know, 1,800 uh, to 1,000 kilos, uh, kilograms per cubic meter of oil that's in this pipeline, uh, pushing down, uh, of course, and then gravity on top of that. So uh, pretty fortunate, I believe, here. Uh, although it looks like they did have some some stuff in place to ensure these pipelines don't collapse. I'm not sure what exactly these these uh, these these things are, but uh, sounds like they've had had some uh, uh, information that this could have been coming or or a huge risk. Um, so okay, so let's get started here on the EOR portion. Uh, as I said, we're going to begin with uh, some of the basics of the oil patch, and then we'll get into the enhanced oil recovery. Uh, quick reminder, anybody on the Twitter space, if you would like to join for the Zoom, whitetundra.ca, scroll to the bottom under events, and the Zoom link is on there for you to uh, look at the visuals as well that we're discussing. Okay, so the drilling side, what do we have? We have vertical wells, we have horizontal wells. Uh, the, the horizontal wells don't exactly look like this with a 90 degree uh, curve here, that would be physically impossible. So uh, I'll discuss more of this as I go on, but it's pretty simple. The vertical wells goes, goes straight down into your rock with the oil. Uh, your horizontal well goes down vertically and then goes horizontally a certain length, depending on certain parameters, which we will discuss. And most, if not all oil and gas sources underground have to have a seal. They need a reservoir seal which is an impermeable rock. So you got oil, you got gas, you got water, you got all sorts of things here. They need to hit a, a, a impermeable barrier, which they cannot cross without any sort of fracking or other uh, geologic shift happening. And then they get trapped here. They get trapped here as more, uh, more and more oil and gas is, call it uh, produced per se, uh, downhole. This, this source rock keeps getting pressurized more and more and more until it hits sort of its limit uh, as to where it can it can hit. Um, and uh, it's an equilibrium with the overall sort of area. And, and just keep in mind, this is like, we're talking not five years, we're talking hundreds of millions of years uh, of, of activity, which creates this, this oil uh, seals and, and source rock and, uh, and whatnot. So uh, th this is by no means a phenomena that uh, if we run out of oil, we just wait 20 years and it and it replenishes. I I don't know um, anybody that believes in that, but uh, just making the point um, even more clear. So we look at what's what's better. So okay, you have you have your vertical drilling, and you have your horizontal drilling. Um, you can see uh, once again here a more detailed diagram. You have your reservoir seal up here. You have your other rocks and stuff uh, that are on top of that. And you have a little trap that's formed. So this, it looks like this gas trap actually got pressurized uh, and it got moved up almost in a way. Then you've got your sandstone, which is a permeable rock uh, in most cases, uh, very nice prosody as well uh, in this, which, which means a number of uh, open air or, or open void in the rock 
where oil, gas, liquids can accumulate. On the bottom of this, you have your actual source rock uh, formation. And this is what you'll see. Usually you'll have your main formation, then you'll have a permeable rock, and then the whatever the lowest or, or the highest pressure is at the bottom, it will go through the sandstone and then accumulate in these seals, uh, which are your, your geologic traps, which are the things that people want to hit um, in, in, in the 1900s, in the 1940s. These were very cool traps that were hit in Leduc, in Nisku, in California, in Texas, uh, all over the place. They hit these little traps. They got massive amounts of high pressured uh, oil and gas, and they did very, very well. These days, we're now having to go into the actual uh, formations down here because a lot of the traps have been developed. They have been produced already. The oil has already been consumed. So we now are going into the your main uh, gas bearing shales, let's say at the bottom, uh, could be at the top. Yeah, but, but usually it's a shale at the bottom. That'll be uh, your petroleum bearing shale. Uh, and then you've got your sandstone as well. This sandstone itself has possibly a bunch of oil and gas trapped in here. And we can do mini fracks, we can do perforations, uh, we can do acid jobs, all, all kinds of things, uh, depending on the parameters, to extract whatever has been migrating through the sandstone and has sort of gotten trapped in here. And, and you know, the Viking, for example, in uh, Saskatchewan is a sandstone and a very prolific acreage that has lasted for many, many decades, right? So, so there's three different kind of areas that the oil is. It's in your source shale, it's in your migratory zones, and then it's in your geologic traps. Uh, the traps might be easier to hit vertically. Everything else is way easier and more economic horizontally uh, in a lot of cases. So what's the other benefit of horizontal drilling? Well, this, you know, you've got this, this city and you're not gonna put a drilling rig in the backyard uh, of your neighbor and start, you know, start pumping away. So that's, that's one thing that's changed with horizontal drilling is we can put the rig on the side here where nobody can see it uh, in today's kind of social climate uh, and, then, and then drill horizontally underneath the town where we need, the, uh, need to recover the oil and gas from. So directional drilling uh, is what they would call it. You go underneath, there's, there's many cities in North America where this is the case and there, there's these zones uh, underneath cities that are basically being depleted every single day. And here you can see how one horizontal well can access way more reservoir than multiple vertical wells when we're talking about going into the source rock or uh, into your uh, migratory uh, sandstone rocks um, as well. So of course, there's economic efficiencies that are gained with horizontal drilling in almost all cases today. And you can see why, that's why the horizontal drilling was maybe about, uh, call it 40 to 50% of the overall wells in 2000 to 2010. Now it's uh, upwards of 80 to 90% of the wells uh, as we move more to the shale and unconventional developments um, going forward. So, okay, this is how a pump jack works. So you've seen these all over the place. Um, you know, here's a picture from Bakersfield, California. Uh, hundreds and thousands of these these pumping units. Uh, people call them pump jacks, pumping units, a ro a rod lift, uh, all all kinds of names for these things. Um, and uh, you know, this this is your pump jack, your walking beam uh, that you see uh, if you're living in in somewhere near oil oil production uh, area. And this is how it works. It basically goes up and down. The, the pumping unit goes up and down based on a uh, engine or a motor, which moves these massive weights in this cyclical pattern. Um, the, the motor moves the weights up and then gravity does the job on the other side, brings the weights down. And, and the beam just goes up and down and up and down. Now, what's happening underneath uh, thousands of meters possibly down hole? You have your little pump. So you have, you have a rod that goes all the way down and connects into a pump, uh, a downhole, what we'll call a downhole pump, uh, rod pump. And, and the pump is very simple. There's, there's a two valve system. There's a top traveling valve 
and then there's a bottom standing valve. So what happens is when, when the pump is pulling up, when the, when the rods are pulling up because of gravity, think about it. It's, it's, you're, you're pulling up against liquid. The top ball will seal against the kind of top of the pump and will not allow liquids up. But because you've um, got equilibrium within your pump, this, this, this bottom valve moves up and opens because the reservoir pressure is higher than the pressure in the pump. It'll open, it lets fluids from the formation come into your pump, your rod keeps going up. Now, when your rod tops out and starts coming down, just think about it, you know, visually, as you're pushing against this fluid, your, your bot, uh, top valve now opens up. You're, you're pushing against fluid, it pushes this ball up, and now fluid can exit the pump and go on top. And stroke by stroke by stroke, it keeps getting pushed up into the surface. And that's what we produce, oil, water, and gas. Uh, so pretty simple, <laughs> simple little operation. Uh, it goes up and down. Uh, a lot of pump jacks are running at two, three, four strokes per minute. So this is not a hammering operation. This is a slow and steady. You know, we don't want any sort of large uh, uh, pressure or forces applied on these valves. They have a maximum capacity they can take. Everything here is mechanical. This is not a video game where things just work forever. These are these are real physical components: steel, aluminum tungsten, um, all kinds of materials here that have a wear life to them. So uh, production operations is a big deal in not, not just enhanced oil recovery, but in regular uh, oil and gas operations. If you have poor operations, you will suffer the consequences with higher maintenance costs, more downtime, higher work over cost, and just poor operational reliability on what you're doing. Um, and if things don't go down, you will suffer from poor performance of your pump. The worse the pump gets, uh, the more worn out the pump gets, the lower the pump efficiency gets. So a brand new pump might be 85% efficient. If it's designed for 40 barrels per day, it'll do 35 as its max. But as you keep wearing out the pump and, and keep pounding it with, with fluids and sand uh, and gas, the pump efficiency keeps uh, keeps going down. We usually replace pumps about when they come down to 20, 30, 40% efficiency, uh, depending how, on how profitable the well is and what we're missing out on. Uh, we will change out the pumps before they get completely destroyed, uh, which is then a job of its own. So like I said, uh, this is Bakersfield, California. Uh, if anybody is in the area, it's not, it's not that far north from Los Angeles. It's not that far south from San Francisco. And not everybody is going to be interested in these kinds of road trips, but, uh, you know, there's roads that go in and out throughout this field. Uh, not all are publicly accessible, but there are a lot that are. So, you know, anybody that's curious about how this works, you can actually get even closer than I would have expected um, in this field, which is a huge field. And then there's this viewing point on top where you get to see the entire field. Uh, it's a cool little operation for, for once again, anybody that's that's maybe in the area uh, and curious. So another way of pumping units is your rotoflex units. Uh, these are very rare, uh, but, but I, the reason I mention these is because we'll be talking about CO2 uh, flooding later on. And the Weyburn field actually has, has a few of these uh, rotoflex units going on. So why do we use these? We use these when we need a higher stroke length. So the pump, remember when I talked about the pump, on a normal uh, pump jack, there's only so much you can go on each stroke and the pump can only be so long. But if you need a very uh, much longer pump, uh, pump barrel, let's say, you need to run these units, which give you a lot more lift. Uh, they allow you to not have this, this constant uh, pressure on both sides of your valve. Uh, they last a lot longer. Um, in, in certain cases, of course, when they're operated properly. And one of my, you know, greatest, this is not my picture, but, but one of my kind of memorable memories is, is when I was operating in the Weyburn field, uh, we went up with the operator here and up here, uh, for, for one of the days, just to check out kind of the view from up top. Uh, and, and, and they, they don't look very tall, but, but they get pretty tall. Uh, and it's, 
it's a nice little, um, you know, uh, I guess, uh, view, not in a city, but in an oil oil field area uh, up there. Uh, so yeah, pretty cool little things, nice, nice sunsets. You can see this is a gorgeous picture uh, that somebody's taken, you know, might actually be Southern or, or Central Alberta uh, slash Saskatchewan here looking at the scenery. So, uh, okay, that's pump jacks. Now we have other ways to bring oil out of the ground. We have what we call plunger lift and plunger lift are used in more gassy wells. So when you have a pump with valves, it has rubber, it has steel. It doesn't like gas. It likes being constantly lubricated by oil. If your well starts producing more gas or it's a gassy well anyway, we have to use plunger lift. So we have very similar looking thing up top, uh, a well head but we don't have any pumping unit. We don't have any rotoflex. It's just your, your, your casing and your tubing. Um, and you have this little spring at the bottom with a plunger. And so how does it work? This, this plunger sits at the bottom of the well and lets the formation pressure up. It lets it keep getting more and more and more pressured up. And when it thinks that the gas has enough velocity to lift the liquids out of the hole, it'll open up and bring up this gas and liquids all with it. So very, very simple operation. It'd be, it'd be just the same as, you know, you've got a, you've got some sort of uh, a valve in your lawn and you open it up and then you just shut it off. You just, you just put your hand there and you pressure it up, you know, sitting in a hot tub is another example. You can, you can pressure up certain of the jets by just kind of restricting their flow. And then when you, when you take your hand off that, there's a period of higher velocity uh, that it comes out with because it's pressurized. So very similar concept, except it's just thousands of meters downhole uh, in certain cases. This is a place where you will see your companies can increase their production a lot. Um, a lot of these plunger lifts are poorly optimized because they're manual. So the operator literally goes there. They make adjustments depending on how the well is doing, depending on how the production is doing. And we now have automation that although it's not 100% accurate, uh, in a lot of cases can actually increase production and runtime in your wells. So um, I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, Yangera was one of the companies that was discussing this, that, hey, you know, our, our wells are too gassy. We're actually gonna go to plunger lifts. And I hope they put some sort of automation on there uh, or at least tracking, which allows them to optimize these going forward. So when we talk about enhanced oil recovery, that covers a certain portion of the oil and gas uh, production, but there's lots of opportunities within existing wells to get them optimized, to get better production. A lot of these wells never got the love that they needed uh, to maximize production in a $50 oil, $1.50 gas environment. So now that we have some more capital, it allows some of these older wells to be optimized and hey, potentially increase production by significant amount now that they're properly capitalized. Uh, okay, there's a couple of questions here. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, thank you, you bet. Uh, so, okay, so that's plunger lift. We also have gas lift. So in certain wells, a plunger lift is not enough. There's too much liquids volumes. We just cannot bring all this all this fluid up. Uh, whoops, what happened here? Uh, yeah. We, we just can't bring all the fluid up with, with just the formation gas. So what we do, we inject gas. So we inject gas on the casing. You can see how, how the, in a, in a typical well bore, you have casing and tubing. The way that I would describe it is think about a can of Coke with a straw in it. So you have the outside casing and then you have a, the straw, the inside tubing. Uh, most of the oil and gas will be produced through the straw and then the outside is just as a protection uh, against the rest of the uh, groundwater and other formations. You don't want random pressure coming in uh, and affecting your production. So you have a second layer of protection. And between the, the straw and the can of Coke, of course, there's going to be liquid uh, kind of sitting there uh, in the meantime. So uh, your, your typical well bore. So in a gas lift, what we do, we inject the gas into the casing on the outside and we pump it through a controlled valves into your tubing. So we go down, we see where the liquid is, and then we inject gas there, pressurize the tubing up and lift the fluid with it. 
very cool systems. Uh, they work very, very well on Montney wells. They work very, uh, uh, very well on uh, some uh, cardium wells as well, I believe. Some of these um, higher liquids, gassy wells. They work really good. Uh, uh, very nice uh, kind of uh, efficient system. It's cheaper if you run it up front. So, you know, when a company's drilling, they'll say, okay, our last five wells uh, needed gas lift. So let's install gas lift going forward on all the wells. And then you have that capacity uh, when the time comes that as the reservoir pressure depletes, now we need more uh, injection pressure to help lift this fluid. Oh, we already have it. Perfect. So, so let's kind of go from there. So um, nice little system. This is kind of the overall well bore. You can see the straw, the can of Coke, and you can see how the red is gas and the blue is liquid. So first we'll inject on the top valve, keep lifting liquid here. Then we'll keep pushing the liquid down the casing. And then we'll go to, to our next valve here and then inject into this and lift all this fluid. So it's just a iterative process that happens uh, over many, many months, I will once again say poor production operations can ruin your well. If you have a Montney well and you start injecting too much gas uh, right off the bat, you will over push the gas down, uh, possibly causing permanent reservoir damage. You might cause near well bore, uh, skin damage is what they call it uh, uh, in these areas. So really the proper production operations can be easily identified uh, if you give me any 10 or 20 or 30 wells in any field uh, and you give me the production history for six months to five years, we can tell you, okay, uh, they overpressured the gas lift or your water flood is not working properly. It's, it, it's relatively easy to tell uh, that these opportunities are out there. And um, I think uh, I, I don't like to call companies out, but if you want to look at uh, one company that's doing a pretty poor job of this, uh, you can go back to my shale update and look at Occidental and look at their, their, their production curves on 2017, 2018, 2019 versus 2020, 2021, 2022. There is a different pattern uh, in those wells because they're choosing to overproduce these wells right off the bat for, for uh, significant long-term consequences uh, to their production profile going forward. Um, in the Permian. Uh, okay, so yeah, so the plunger restricts the flow, yes, to increase the pressure. The fluid doesn't actually rise in the tubing. The, the plunger just sits there. It lets pressure build up, build up, build up. And then you can either set it manually or automatically and say, okay, at this pressure down hole or at surface, bring the plunger up and that, and that valve opens. Uh, it lets all the pressure come up all at once and it brings the liquid with it, hopefully uh, with enough liquid velocity uh, to, to, to carry that liquid up with it. Enough gas velocity to carry the liquid up with it. Uh, okay, are there filters down the tubing and down the flow line? So uh, there is certain filters uh, that can be used in the tubing, uh, sand filters. There are also filters on surface that can be used. And I'll talk about this uh, here later on because it's just easier to do it with the picture there, uh, visually uh, easier to explain. So um, yes, yeah. Yeah, so Damien, so it is a, uh, yes, it is an on-off operation. So it'll it'll pressurize for 16 minutes and it'll kick on for five minutes. And then when the fluid velocity drops um, to a certain extent, it'll shut back down again. It'll send that plunger down uh, the well. And the plunger is an actual solid steel piece that sits in the tubing. The reason why it's there is to kick out any wax or any other issues that are blocking the tubing uh, uh, because you don't want that. You want the solid steel. Every time it kicks on, it it pushes everything out of the way. Any sand, any uh, wax, asphaltines. Uh, and yes, it does scrape the side. Yeah. Uh, this is one thing you have to be careful of is the tubing wear uh, with a plunger well because it, it goes cling, 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 cling and hits every single uh, joint on the way up. And this is one of the cool parts of the oil field where I, I can only explain it, uh, but sometimes when you're, when you're trying to figure out what's wrong with a plunger well or what the issue is, um, all you gotta do is stand right by the well, 
and you'll hear the plunger come up. It'll go, it'll just be this, this constant like ding, 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 ding. And then as it gets closer, it'll just get more and more because the plunger is picking up speed uh, as it comes up. If you don't hear that, but the well is still flowing when the valve opens, that means your plunger got stuck somewhere. It hit a sand bridge. It hit some sort of wax. It hit something and it's not coming up, uh, which is kind of a significant issue that now you need to resolve. Uh, and there's various ways to do that. Uh, maybe maybe something for another video uh, where, where I can share some actual pictures uh, of things that went wrong um, or went right, I guess, uh, in the past. Uh, yeah, you can ruin any well by pulling on it too quick. Any any well can be ruined. I will talk about this uh, as well uh, as, as the presentation uh, continues here. So other than pump jacks and plunger lift and gas lift, what do we have? We have ES, uh, or sorry, PCP, progressive cavity pumps. So these are basically the same kind of pump with the same rod. You can see how the rod goes down into your well, except they're run by an electric motor. So the motor spins this rod round and round instead of a pump downhole. Uh, well, this one also has a pump, which I'll, which I'll share here. It's a different kind of pump. It's not a pump with two valves. It's a spinning pump that basically just spins the, wa the water and the liquids and the oil so fast that it just kind of gets into this circular pattern and comes up the well. Um, a little side point, I guess, this uh, little orange thing on top is very nice because you can look across the valley and know if a well is running or not because this diamond-shaped uh, thing, I guess, I'm, I'm not even sure what you call it, uh, at this point, but uh, it it it'll go you know in a circular pattern, and and you'll be able to tell uh, whether your well is on or not from way across the valley in the middle of winter. You can tell, spot it. That's why it's orange as well. And usually they have a a um, reflective sticker on it. And what the reflective sticker allows you to do is you can shoot the speed at which your your rod is turning. Um, because just think about it, your 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 sticker is. Be is going to be on one side of this orange diamond and you have a gun that shoots it's a it's literally a radar gun uh, that shoots how many times uh you're 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 reflecting off that sticker uh in a five second or ten second period uh so pretty cool things they are mostly for heavy oil these pcp pumps uh you'll mostly see them in lloydminster in macklin in uh some places in 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 saskatchewan as well uh pretty cool little units very cheap to run and operate uh, compared to a pumping unit, which you, you you have to set it up. You need the uh, uh, a place for it to sit on. You need the constant maintenance on the unit. These just run. And this is what you have down hole. So you, you have this basically long, uh, uh, windy, spirally sort of unit. And imagine it, it just, it just spins round and round at sometimes three, 400 rotations per minute. So that's like five or six rotations per second. And it gives the fluid velocity, pushes it up uh, the entire well. Uh, of course, these are not bulletproof. They are uh, getting abrased by sand. The water affects them, especially if the water starts knocking in a weird uh, kind of pattern. And, and the way to describe that is when you have a water bottle and you're pouring it out, you can either pour it at the right speed where the water just trickles out but if you if you tilt the the bottle too much, you get this glug 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 uh, sort of uh, a a pounding effect that happens, which can also happen in these downhole under massive pressure, massive temperature, and these have rubbers on each side of it. So if you got a rubber that's that's undergoing this um, sort of violent pattern, you can cause some serious damage on these wells. Um, I think uh, anybody who's operated PCP pumps. Uh, or uh, or these pumps on surface uh, will tell you that that there's, you know, you you just walk in the building, you hear the noise that the pump is making, and you know it's been shot. It's just been completely destroyed because it'll have this nasty sound uh, that it'll be making of 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 metal and water and fluid, um, in this sort of uncontrollable, violent fashion, um, and you know that's a twenty thousand dollar bill right there. So. Uh, some of the cool things, I guess, that you learn uh, while they're uh, while they're in the oil patch um, is that sound plays a big impact. You can tell a lot of things 
just by listening and figuring out, okay, this is how, uh, you know, the sound was, this is how the sound is. That means something is wrong here. It's not operating at its usual uh, sort of conditions. And PCPs are one where there is a lot of new technology coming on. So we have some sand control PCPs. We have some water control PCPs. We have some high efficiency uh, PCPs happening. Uh, this is a case study from Albania, actually, from Schlumberger. And you can see how they've really increased the runtime on the PCP by uh, uh, creating some different flow patterns uh, and design on this. So a lot of engineering has gone into this. You know, Schlumberger is not just a OFS company, meaning they just run rigs and they run frack fleets. They, they actually innovate on the day-to-day -day production operation side, uh, which often gets, uh, gets forgotten because it's not a high kind of revenue sexy business uh, like, like those rigs are. Uh, but, but definitely, you know, a lot of engineering and technical detail that goes into this. Uh, and, and I will say for anybody, you know, maybe, maybe I should be recommending this, maybe I shouldn't, but for anybody that's, that's really curious and maybe you work for an oil and gas company, uh, Weatherford in Calgary downtown runs absolutely phenomenal uh, a training courses, completely free, where you can go, you can see a, a, a rod, you can see a PCP pump, you can see a gas lift valve, you can sleep, uh, see a plunger valve, uh, a plunger lift, I should say, and a, and a bumper spring that goes down hole. And they will explain all of that to you um, because of course it's their business, right? They want to sell these things. So, um, you know, if you have any contacts uh, uh, in the OFS side, Maybe you don't have a chance to go and go on a drilling rig and check that out, uh, but you can definitely see these things and and they're openly sitting there uh, in Weatherford's office. Uh, so so maybe um, you know just something cool. I like to I like to share these things because uh, certain investors are interested. Uh, and then yeah, they do have those courses as well, which they hold every three or six months, uh, which are really really phenomenal. I I really got to give them kudos uh, for that. Uh, for for giving information to the ENP, uh, of course, I attended these courses not as an investor, but as a uh, field. Uh, when I used to operate my wells in the field uh, and perform the the kind of uh, optimization on them on a day to day basis. Okay, so that's our PCP. We also have ESP, uh, electrical submersible pump, very similar uh, as a PCP, except it runs just slightly different. Uh, instead of one long tube, they have multiples of these impellers and diffusers. Uh, they do a very similar thing. They add velocity to the uh, fluid in a circular pattern and push them up uh, up the well bore. Very expensive, way more expensive than your PCP pump. Uh, some of these can be two hundred fifty thousand, four hundred thousand dollars uh, to do a job on on replacing one of these. Uh, this is very high quality. Uh, possibly tungsten carbide, uh, possibly some other material that's very good with sand, very good with water. And these can do, in some cases, uh, five, seven, 10,000 barrels per day uh, of, of fluid bringing up the wellbore. So you can see there's a lot of stress on this equipment uh, as time goes on. And because these are electrical, they're controlled by what we call a VFD a variable frequency drive. And it is just as simple as your air conditioning. You go in there, you turn a toggle and say, oh, today I want this to run at 60 Hertz. And that means we're gonna get um, you know, this many barrels of fluid out. And then the next day you say, oh, well, uh, we actually have enough, uh, you know, we're having a downtime. We can't produce this as hard. You just, you know, tone it down. And uh, I guess a better analogy would be the AC in your car. Uh, uh, in your vehicle, you know, just, it's just as simple as that. And it's in real time, uh, fantastic machines. Uh, of course, they rely on electricity, uh, which is why when, when certain companies are, are saying electrical costs are really uh, impacting our operations uh, in terms of producing wells and operating cost, here's one of your big power consumers. Here is your other one on the PCP. This is an electrical motor uh, that, that uses grid power. Uh, and then here's your VFT that uses uh, electrical power. So, um, you know, definitely one that that companies in a 
low power environment really use them. But as electricity prices rise in certain parts of the world, you're seeing more and more of these power generation co-gen units getting built to effectively hedge yourself uh, uh, against the, the rising cost of power. Okay, so I think I'll do another quick reminder. Uh, anybody on the Twitter space that would like to join for the Zoom visuals, uh, you're maybe wondering what we're talking about, but you don't see the pictures. Uh, whitetundra.ca, if you scroll to the bottom under events, the Zoom link is in there uh, and you can uh, join us for the slideshow uh, as well. Uh, okay, so there's a few questions here. Um, do they have submersible electric motor pumps down hole? Uh, yeah, yeah, this is frequently used for water production, actually, when you need source water to fulfill a water flood voidage, which we'll discuss later. Uh, you need these high powered electric, uh, uh, electric force rather than mechanical force. And these work exceptionally for source water wells. And how can you replace a pump uh, without oil and gas coming in your face? Yeah, so so great question. So um, I'll, I'll kind of talk about this maybe a little bit later on uh, because I have a picture of the wellhead exactly, uh, which will give you a better idea. Uh, than uh, than this right now, but but I will discuss that here um, as we kind of go on here. Um, I believe it's it's upcoming shortly. Actually, not not that far. Uh, so so here's another uh, interesting thing that's happened with ESPs. ESP frequently go down on power bumps or power issues. So let's say you're somewhere in Calgary, you have a field up in Rainbow Lake or way up there somewhere that is running on ESP. Uh, I'm not sure if, if Rainbow Lake uses ESP. I'm just I'm just trying to make a uh, point. You now have the ability to remote start these. So it used to be you get a power bump. Now you have to go in the field, restart every single well one by one, clear the the error, make sure everything is good, restart it. In a lot of cases, not required. It it's a overly safe um, sort of operating way of doing things. So they have now remote starts. You can sit in your home, you have access on a UI, a user interface to go and start these things and kind of run them. So what are you getting? Better runtime. You're getting better operational efficiency. Um, of course, the risk of something being wrong goes up very minutely because you're not physically there. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it is adding to a lot of the uh, operational runtime that we're seeing uh, increase as as sort of time goes on, is this remote operating capability uh, on these things? And uh, I'll tell you something. When I was operating at Modern Resources, I I had cameras set up on certain wells that were way in the bush, that were like ATV only wells. I had cameras set up that would send me pictures every twelve hours of that well. I would know if it's not leaking. I would know there's nothing wrong. Uh, nothing has broken. There's no issues. And if the well went down. I had the confidence to restart it remotely, uh, knowing that there's nothing leaking or burst or exploded or on fire. So, you know, these things work in tandem with other technologies that are out there, which give you that that operational benefit and the safety, uh, no loss of safety along with it. Uh, approximately how many barrels would be raised with each plunger lift? So. Um, let me just uh, think here. So the plungers that I used to operate and, and of course the oil patch comes in all shapes and all sizes. So this is not by any means a, a one size fits all thing, but um, the plungers that I used to operate would make 15 barrels in a day. Uh, and the plunger would cycle three times an hour. Uh, let's say so. So on each, on each pull of the plunger uh, you're making maybe a quarter of a barrel. So 10 gallons every 20 minutes. That's that's sort of what we would produce. Uh, so not 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 all that much. A lot of these wells are older wells that go on plunger lift because the gas rate gets too high compared to the oil rate. But 10 gallons every uh, 20 minutes on hundreds of wells, you're making some serious money uh, when you think about it that way. So... We'll just talk about one more, uh, one or two more things here. 
and then we'll get into the enhanced oil recovery. This is a horizontal drill that was drilled in 2015. Notice the problem. We, we didn't have the technology at the time in unconsolidated sands to drill a, a very nice, neat pattern. So you get this dog-legged fashion well, which now is what? It's, it's now the production engineer's fault. So, you know, you could have a very nice reservoir and the drilling and completion company completely screwed it up. Uh, the well site, um, you know, engineer completely screwed this thing up. And maybe it's not their fault. It's just how the formation is. Uh, and we didn't have the technology at the time, but we do now. So we're, we're going to see certain companies drill way better horizontals in unconsolidated sands. Um, again, this is not an enhanced oil recovery specific topic, but it's a overall production operations field development topic uh, that you're going to see as time goes on. Better geosteering, better staying in the zone, uh, better uh, uh, MWD technology, measurements while drilling technology, and just better even uh, horizontal profiles on your well. Think about this kind of well horizontally this way. So what if this well produces sand and there's a big gush of sand that comes in right here? You've effectively blocked out the, the latter third of your well bore from ever producing again because that sand is never gonna have enough velocity to be carried up here, all the way up here. And this is about six meters um, uh, vertically that you have to carry it up. Sand is very, very heavy for anybody that's, that's you know, being to the beach knows it's, it's a very heavy product. So you gotta carry it all the way up here and then bring it into your, your, your pump. And then you gotta pump it out of the well as well. So um, when I see this in certain fields, in certain pools that I'm looking at, uh, this is all publicly available data. And then I see certain companies have bought these uh, uh, projects. Uh, certain companies are looking at capitalizing these assets. I say, okay, so not only am I getting uh, this, this pool or this field getting capitalized, but there's some serious engineering problems that the previous operator had because they weren't paying attention uh, or, or, or they just didn't have the expertise or technology at the time. So... Um, definitely something that's more applicable to heavier oil uh, properties where, where you have these unconsolidated sands, uh, which create this problem, but something for people who really want to deep dive uh, uh, into certain companies can can kind of see uh, based on Petro Ninja that, okay, there's an opportunity here for better drilling and way better wells uh, going forward in some of these, you know, relatively uh, underproduced pools out there. Sand control. So one of the things you can do for sand control, you don't want the sand sloughing in into your tubing. Uh, and here is a, a very nice look at a horizontal well. It's not a 90 degree. It's a slow kind of kickoff. And then it slowly merges into a horizontal well. You know, you, you can kind of barely see it here. This looks like an offshore well uh, is what they're showing. So, but you can see the the gradual increase in, uh, in incline as the well goes on. And you have these protective outer shrouds, you have a sand filtration media downhole that can protect you from all the sand sloughing in all at once uh, and blocking up your tubing and your flow. And then there's other uh, activation chambers and all this technology that's, that's now going to be implemented going forward, given that a lot of it uh, was developed during 2014 to 2020, in order to support lower operating cost, but the technology never got implemented because nobody had the money. So as time goes on, you're gonna see more and more of this being deployed out in the field uh, and just generate better margins, better OPEX and uh, better wells, better production, which means more cash flow uh, going forward. Here's your surface sand separators. So somebody had asked the question, do you have anything to uh, 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 you know, fix this problem, uh, the sand issue and whatnot. So we have something downhole. We also have something on the surface. So this is a Cameron sand separator, I believe owned by Shlumber J now, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And so every single thing that comes out of downhole goes through your separator and then it leaves uh, from a higher point. Or sorry, it comes in from a higher point and it leaves at a lower point. Um, yeah, 
So what you have in this vessel is sand will drop out just based on gravity and retention time so that your actual very expensive surface facilities are not having to deal with sand, which by the way, corrodes everything. Uh, it'll, it'll create these little dents in your, in your flow lines. And then the, you know, water will come in, start corroding away at that dent. And eventually you're going to have a leak at some point or the entire pipeline could uh, kind of rupture open. So uh, definitely something that is a risk reward. Uh, certain companies choose to not run these and they pay the consequences, even though they save on the rental cost uh, or the purchase cost of these units, which are quite expensive. These are ten, fifteen thousand dollars a month on each well uh, that uh, that you're paying for. So, you know, one of the other reasons why operating cost kind of can go up and down during the life cycle of a well, uh, and then you add on top of that that the well itself produces different fluid uh, and oil rates uh, uh, during its life cycle, which um, obviously affects the dollar per BOE operating cost in both ways over a period of time. Um, okay, so yeah, this is all for all the drilling reports are from Petroninja, but it's also publicly available on any other platform um, such as GeoScout, AccuMap, uh, and, and, and various others. So yeah, and, and the downhole technology is not cheap. Anything in the oil field is not cheap. Let's just, let's just get that up front. If you have a small bolt that you're using in your house to fix up something that's going to be $5, it's going to be $15 in the oil field. That's just how it is. Um, it's just the way the oil field runs because everything has to be more, uh, more uh, uh, to certain specs. There's less tolerance for error. Uh, sometimes it has to be made out of stainless steel instead of other steel. So everything just costs more. And some of these downhole things I'm showing you are hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, every single time you got to run them. And sometimes they break. And now you got to pull the entire thing out while you're paying fifty to $75,000 a day, uh, possibly uh, depending on how and where your well is. Um, other service rigs in, in older fields can cost seven, eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a day while you're doing all these activities as well. So here's your compressor. Uh, I talk about compressors very briefly because this is more oil focused presentation, but I mentioned this in the Montney presentation. So I think it's worth re resharing. When you have gas and you want to put it into a pipeline, your gas must be higher pressure than the pipeline. Simple physics. Pressure can only go from high to low. So com what compressors do, they take low pressure gas and they literally compress it into high pressure gas. This is a, a unit very similar to what's out there uh, in the oil patch. Uh, I believe this is a Waukesha unit. Uh, uh, looks like it anyway. And this is what it looks like from the inside. These are massive engines and massive compressors on top of that. You know, very dangerous, call it, uh, compared to relative, uh, you know, life in the city. Uh, uh, a quite, quite high pressure, uh, high temperature, very sensitive equipment that's running out there. One of these units could be $15, 20000000 million uh, of, for each of them. And they have very specific tolerances uh, that they can run under. Some are multi-stage compressors. So they take low pressure gas, compress it to medium pressure. Then they take the medium pressure gas, compress it to high pressure to get into the pipeline. So very cool engineering behind these um, decades of maintenance and operating uh, standard operating procedures behind this sort of equipment. Here's the same thing from a side view. Each of these is a cylinder. So think about the cylinder in your engine, uh, in your vehicle and how kind of size it is. And then this is just a big, much bigger cylinder. <laughs> Uh, very cool. Uh, anybody who's into the technical engineering part of a uh, part of things will really enjoy uh, watching a, a oil change being done or a maintenance, like a two thousand hour maintenance being done on one of these units. A phenomenal experience. You get to see a lot of things. Uh, a, a very cool and uh, just goes to show you the level of detail and expertise it requires to maintain these units. You know, when somebody tells me that hey, there's a labor shortage in oil and gas, and uh, we're just going to bring random people in and, and pump them into the industry. Well, 
it it doesn't quite work that way. It's this this is a specialized skill. Uh, people specialize on certain compressors, on certain units, on certain engines. You need thousands of hours of experience to be able to catch any problems that are occurring. So it's not as simple as that. As as you know, we just pump a warm body in here and they can figure it out. It's it's a very specialized skill. Uh, I was paying my mechanics. Um, now, if I can remember correctly, I think in certain cases, there's a team of two. So there's a main mechanic and then a helper. I think we were paying them over $275 to, to $300 an hour to do the work. So this is a very nice uh, gig, but you need the specialized skills. You need to work in minus 40. You need to work in plus 50. And, and these buildings get really hot. Think about your engine bay while it runs, uh, while your vehicle runs. It is hot in there. And this is an entire building with a way bigger engine uh, uh, in here. So fascinating stuff uh, to me anyway. Um, okay, here is your tubing that goes in the well. So for people that are wondering what, what the straw part of that example looks like, this is your tubing. There are about, uh, each of them is called a joint and they're about nine to 10 meters in length each. And you connect all of them you know, basically through through uh, swivels, and uh, that's your well. That's your well bore. You have multiples of these in in nine to ten meter increments, and they make up your well. Uh, if any of them has a problem down in the well, guess what? You got to pay a service rig, pull them all out until you get to the problem one, replace it, and then and then go and uh, go back in. If you have to change your downhole pump, uh, you know. A luck is on your side. You you now have to pull out all the rods. So so not all the tubing. You have to pull out all the rods uh, until you get to the pump. Sometimes companies will pull tubing anyway, uh, just to make sure everything is good, and possibly replace a certain worn down parts of the tubing while they have uh, you know while they have the rig out there uh, anyway. So that's your tubing. Here is your wellhead. Uh, so you have your your well coming out. You have your casing line. So again, this is your casing. Of course, it's it's on the outside, right? And then you have your tubing, which is your inside. Oil and gas comes up here. It goes into your, your tubing. It goes in the ground to your oil battery. The casing can be turned on or off. If you wanna produce from the casing, you just open this valve, this gate valve uh, is what we call them, and it flows. If not, you leave it shut down and you just produce out of the tubing. So now there's a question, how, how can you change the pump without something blowing up in your face? So what, what the service rig will do, what the service rig will do, it will, it will latch on to this wellhead. It will isolate the top part from the bottom part and they have their own valves and safety uh, equipment that can handle all the pressure. So they connect on top. They have this line that goes way up into the rig uh, and the rig tanks and the rig rig sort of uh, uh, volume area. And uh, they have their own system where they can produce out of this with a very strict uh, operating guidelines and make sure nothing's spilling or leaking or kind of you have this uncontrolled pressure event. And there's safety valves that are in there that will automatically close or open uh, depending on kind of the situation in the well. If the rig is not able to handle the pressure coming out of the well, they will sometimes have a pop tank. So an extra tank that they'll connect a line to where, okay, all hell is breaking loose here. We can't control the well, divert the flow into this tank, which can hold 50, 60, 100, in some cases, thousands of barrels that they can kind of redirect into while they figure out how to control the well. And what can they do to control the well? They can, they can start pumping this heavy water into the well, they can start throwing sandbags into the well. There's there's sort of various things they can do to basically overpressure from their side to restrict the formation uh, from producing. So uh, hopefully that kind of answers your, uh, answers your question. Um, I'll discuss more on that as well as we as we sort of go on. How do they know when the tubing is past worn? So there's a few things you can do. You can you can go along the tubing on the outside and laser scan it which tells you what is the wall thickness that's left on the on the sort of that part of the tubing. You can go in the tubing with a certain sort of camera, push it through. 
it will tell you what the wall thickness is left on the sides of the tubing. So if the tubing started off with a five millimeter, let's say wall thickness, and you find a spot where it's down to one millimeter, you should probably replace that before that one millimeter gets worn out. And then you have this leak event. Uh, what makes the leak events more uh, probable is that most tubing have a coating on the inside that is corrosion resistant. But when you have uh, when you have plungers, when you have wax, when you have kind of water, what what it can do is create a dent in that in that stainless steel. And what happens when you have a dent? All the corrosive activity starts getting uh, attracted to that to that open area, and they just start piling in and they create a worse and worse situation. So what you really wanna do is prevent that, that, that dent or the ding uh, from occurring in the first place by having proper production operations, by restricting wax formation, uh, by restricting leaving water sitting, uh, salty water sitting in your tubing for, for long periods of time. There's proactive maintenance that can be done. And also why, when people say, okay, uh, if we shut this well in, it's going to take a lot of money to bring it back. That's why they say that because you might have water sitting in a certain part of your tubing. It might be sour water. It might be a high dissolved content water, salty water. And if you leave it for a week, a month, a year, it's going to corrode away and you'll need to do, uh, do some checks up front uh, to make sure that you don't have any safety problems here uh, that are going to result in a massive spill. So uh, it's it's always a difficult decision to shut a well in. It's not as easy as just, hey, let me open this valve and let me op uh, close this valve and open this valve. There's there's a definite impact there uh, that you have to take into account. And which is why a lot of wells, when, when COVID first hit, a lot of wells didn't get shut in till May, you know, mid-May of 2020, because operators were hoping and praying that, hey, just get it above 30 or $40 a barrel and we can keep these wells running without having to shut these in. Uh, obviously that didn't happen with the way Saudi and Russia got into their fight and the rest is history, uh, as they say. So a little more information on kind of the, what, what can we do to figure out what's happening with the well? Here's your tubing, here's your casing. Red is gas, green is oil. Certain wells out there are operated very, let's just say risk aversely. When you get a new operator comes in, they go and buy a field, they say, okay, this is a nice little field. We're gonna optimize it. We're gonna do some more efficiency here. What can they do? The first thing they can do is figure out, do they have excess oil sitting in the casing? If you have excess oil sitting in the casing, your pump should be running faster because the formation is giving you more oil you're just not pulling it up fast enough. So there are certain acquisitions that have been made. Um, I will maybe leave it at that. Uh, this mostly applies to heavy oil fields where wells are just not operated properly. So what you do, you shoot nitrogen into your casing. So you connect this, what we call a fluid shot gun, also known as echo meter, and we'll connect it into a casing here and we'll pump or push nitrogen into the well. What the nitrogen does is it, is it bounces off the liquid level and it comes back up. There is your top of the fluid level. This is literally what this machine will spit out. It will tell you how many tubing collars you hit and then where the fluid is. And then what do you do? We go all the way back to the caveman days. We literally count the lines. Each line is one joint of tubing, nine to 10 meters as I shared earlier. So this looks like there's about 55-ish uh, joints, roughly, which tells me my fluid is 550 meters below surface. If my pump is 900 meters below surface, that means I have a lot of joints of fluid here still to pull, pull uh, up through my tubing and I can speed my pump up. This was a daily procedure that we used to do on certain wells that were new, uh, we would shoot fluid shots maybe three, four, five times a day to make sure our pump speed is at the right speed. You don't want to over pull on this because what will you get? You'll get gas into your pump. Pumps don't like gas. Rubber and steel don't like gas. You want to make sure you have some safety net 
but not this much safety net. And this is where you'll see some optimizations uh, in the heavy oil part of the world where uh, companies have been artificially running their pumps slower because why produce in a 40, 50, $60 environment? Slow it right down, produce the minimum that you can. And then when things, uh, uh, when things are good, when the commodity prices are good, ramp these pumps up. Uh, of course, slowly, you, you don't want to go and say, oh, it's doing 100 uh, RPM, let's go 500. You never want to do that. We go five RPM per week, very, very, very slow. We monitor things. And once again, you get these hot and horny uh, uh, companies out there that just want to massively increase production right away. And they screw up the entire reservoir. They screw up the wells. You get gas locking, you burn up your pump. Now you're down, you got to pay for a $25,000 rig job. So, you know, production operations, it, it always comes down to production operations. Uh, you don't want very aggressive people out there uh, who are just, just you know, wanting to go and, and put their pedal to the metal. Uh, gradually, it's a reservoir. There's a lot of moving factors. We can't, we, we can't treat it like a, like a accelerator on a V8. You got to play with it slowly, figure out what's happening, take it slow, and the reservoir will reward you with more oil production and higher runtime. Um, so yeah, I guess it even tells you uh, here the, the different um, uh, call it pressures and different terms and what they mean. So uh, here's a pressure in the bottom hole. Uh, here's a pressure uh, in the pump, near pump. Uh, this is your gas free liquid above your pump. Um, and just, just so people can maybe compare, uh, I've seen wells out there today uh, already that I see optimization opportunities within companies that I own uh, that are operating at 15 to 20 joints above the fluid uh, or 15 to 20 joints of fluid that they still have to optimize. When I used to operate wells for CNRL, I ran one, maximum two joints of fluid. At, at max two joints of fluid. And I would shoot my wells every 15 days. I, I had a very good understanding of how the wells were, uh, how they reacted, uh, what sort of issues they were suffering. And uh, we, would, uh, we would keep things very, very tip top shape, uh, which is what you, you, you should expect out of a good field operator uh, and a good field engineer and, and, a, and a company in general uh, that's operating some of these long life, uh, low decline fields. And I'll share a specific example of this here uh, shortly. Um, okay, here is your rods that go in the hole. So just a quick picture. These are your rods. Once again, they are connected with this swivel pattern. And if you have a rod that breaks, somehow you have to pull all the rods out till you find the broken one, and then you got to replace it or fix it up. Sometimes you got to do a fishing exercise. So if, if the rod breaks, well, at some point you have no rod to pull out. So you have to go down with these tools that literally in the fluid, find the rod, grab onto it and fish it out um, because you have no other way uh, if it fell in the hole like that. Um, okay, so yeah, I, I still got a lot of slides here. So um, I'll try and get to the water flooding here right away. So. Here is the <clears throat> aforementioned uh, wireline rig. So the question that was asked, how do you how do you fix up the well? You can see how the how the the rig. Uh, this is slick line a rig, not wireline, but effectively the same. And they have this long derrick, which allows them to have a much longer wellhead. So they have this pressure kind of chamber uh, of insurance while they open the well. And they can produce and use this as sort of a safety margin uh, along with their other valves and whatnot. This is my field at Modern that I used to operate. Uh, we have two, two slick line units going on different wells. I was doing a de-wax job on one and doing a plunger replacement job on the other uh, on this side. I also have a vac truck with me, a vacuum truck. Basically what it does is it holds chemicals. It can hold methanol. It can hold water, all kinds of different uh, liquids, which I use to help me uh, clear up the wells. And then I have a steam truck with me. So because this was a waxy well, what we would sometimes do is as, as the wax is coming out, we would heat up the tubing 
so that it would be more dissolved as opposed to these chunks of heavy hard wax coming in and uh, creating problems in the well bore, in your flow line, and in your service facilities. We rather keep our temperature higher and uh, melt the wax. So uh, slick line units, this is my pressure truck right here. Uh, yeah, sorry, not vac truck, pressure truck is what I meant, uh, is what I have here. Uh, and they go out to different sizes, depending on what sort of uh, pressure you want to pump into the well with. They can also pull on the well as well. And then you have your steam truck, which is literally steam. It has a big tank of water. It heats it up to steam, and then you can inject it uh, either down the well, in the flow line, uh, wherever you want. Uh, okay, so yeah, I mean, I guess I'll just repeat this. This is a very technically focused session. Uh, I by no means expect people to be following every single thing as we go. Um, the recording will be on YouTube here uh, by by today evening, and uh, maybe we'll allow a kind of session to be there, uh, which can be revisited uh, for sure. So yeah, great a great comment there. So can they restrict the well the the flow of the well to fifty percent instead of fully shutting them in? They can in certain cases, but there's other factors, right? If you restrict your flow to 50%, maybe now your velocity is not enough to carry liquids up on a plunger well, let's say. Uh, maybe your pump is, um, you know, maybe you can't carry sand up with your oil if you restrict the velocity of the uh, flow regime. So, and and flow regimes, flow regimes themselves change depending on the velocity of the liquid you have coming up with the gas. So can they... It's going to be on a on a well by well basis. Um, it's not a just a end all be all answer I can give you. Uh, it is it is just how it is. You have certain wells you can, certain wells you can't. Um, okay, so on the echo, I'm loving these questions. Very 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 detailed. Um, so on the on the echo meter, does it adjust for one joint of tubing going down, or does it count the same joint twice? So Basically, let's just go back to the echo meter. This is the joints going down. And then you've hit your fluid. What you'll find is if this is 55 joints, another 55 joints later, you'll have another mini spike, which is telling you you're now back up um, to your surface hit. And then depending on how much nitrogen you put in and what pressure you are shooting that nitrogen at, you might get more and more pattern, like the same uh, a pattern develop, but at some point the nitrogen just loses signal and all you need is one anyway. So uh, uh, this just tells you where, where the fluid hit is and then that's it. Certain echo meters will hit, you'll find maybe there's a false reading that comes because maybe there's a gas hit and then a water hit and then an oil hit, or you've hit some sort of sand bridge in the well uh, which you didn't take into account was what could be a possibility. So nothing is a science, an exact science. Uh, field operating is an art. It's a scientific art of sorts. There's a lot of subjectivity. That's why when I talk to my companies, especially junior companies that I'm looking to possibly invest in, I ask them, um, how long have your operators been been working on these wells? How much experience do they have? How much experience does your trucker have on this well that he's, that he's pulling fluids out of? Uh, how much experience does your compressor mechanic have uh, as to what they're doing on this field? Not, not in general, on this field, because they will know the inside out of each well. Uh, I like to make this sort of comment uh, as, a, as a joke, but it is true. Uh, your oil wells are like, are like babies, are like kids. Each one is slightly different. They got different things that tick them off. They got different things they like. They got different levels they like to operate at. Uh, some produce more sand. They're, they're not similar. They, they look similar, but they have uh, slight differences that when you operate a field for six months, 12 months, 18 months, you try and figure out what, uh, what makes each well tick, what makes it work, and you really get to know these things. Um, so I do find that a little uh, something different. And I think depending on the answers I get, not, not all management teams know, know uh, the answers to these questions, but how excited the management team gets when I ask these questions and how much they understand why I'm asking these questions 
gives me a different level of credibility because they understand why I'm asking this, why this is important that your field operators and your mechanics and whatnot maintain this uh, kind of consistency in your field. Uh, when I used to operate at Modern, once again, my my compressor mechanic knew exactly when there was a problem. He he would even, you know, as soon as I would call him, I'd say, hey, this is the noise I'm hearing. These are the pressures, blah, blah, blah. And he'd go, yep, I saw this in 2016. This is what the problem is. I'll be out there in 45 minutes with this part. And I'm like, okay, perfect. You know, this is a great. Uh, so for sure, kudos to the guys and gals out there, uh, you know, that are working 24 seven, 365 and with exceptional, um, I don't know if street smart is the right word, but but uh, oil field smarts, uh, let's say, uh, put it that way. Uh, yes, and and yes, rods are almost the same length as joints. Yeah, so so very similar as well. But but we we shoot we don't shoot echometers in the tubing. We shoot it in the casing. Uh, so basically, we're looking at joints of tubing, not uh, rods itself. So. How much production does 200 meters of unused oil correspond to? So the answer is, it could be five barrels per day, could be half a barrel per day, could be hundreds of barrels per day. And the reason I say that is, let's say you have a column of a fluid, right? Every column of fluid has a pressure. The, the, the column of fluid is gonna have a higher pressure than a column of gas, right? So when you have this column of fluid, it's naturally restricting your formation from producing at the pressures that it could because you have this, this massive column that's, that's pushing against your formation per se, just based on gravity. So as you produce that, you might find your formation is giving you more and more fluid and you can keep increasing that pump a lot, a lot of RPMs. In certain cases you might find the formation is kind of dead. It's it's just this column that's sitting here, um, and you can just run volumetric analysis on if you got five and a half inch casing, you got two and seven eighths tubing inch um, diameter. Um, this is the volume that two hundred meters of sort of cylindrical uh, uh, volume will have. You produce that much oil, and then you have to lower your pump again uh, to kind of a lower rate. Uh, that the formation gives. In certain cases, you might hit the jackpot on an older well that you bought, that somebody else bought, that they never optimized. And so therefore, now, now you start speeding the pump up and you find, hey, this 30 barrel per day well is doing 150 barrels per day. And it'll, it'll stay there for years in certain cases, uh, which is kind of one of the opportunities that I really, um, I, I almost nerd out on. When I'm looking at Petro Ninja, I see a well which was making seven barrels and now it's flatlined at 40 barrels. I say, hell yeah, you know, this, this, this is what I like to see from my companies. This is what I want to see them doing uh, is, is, is going out and, and, and optimizing these wells. And of course you don't want to see a, 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 a sudden increase. You want to see a gradual increase uh, unless there's been some work over activity uh, that's being done as well. So uh, unfortunately, Casper, the, the answer to your question once again, is it's a scientific art. Uh, it, it kind of changes, but certain wells will perform really well. In almost all cases, you will gain production by pulling your fluid level down. Uh, some companies operate really risk averse and they fall into trouble with, with sort of this mentality that we don't want the pump to burn up. Well, let me ask you, if the well makes an extra 10 barrels per day at a $50 net back, just, just 10 barrels per day at a $50 net back, um, you're talking about $500 a day. In a month, you're talking about $15,000. How much is a rig job? $15,000. Can you afford to take a risk and, and see if the well will produce 10 more barrels per day at the cost of a one month of, of, of production and you might have to do a rig job? I, I think I would take that bet almost every single time when I have at least five to seven to 10 excess joints of fluid uh, that's sitting there. Are, restricting flow and not giving me my max production, I'll, I'll take those bets. Now, if somebody says you want to run zero joints of fluid, no, it's not worth it. The extra benefit of that one or two joints of fluid, not worth it. Uh, but the excess on top of that, yeah, I'll, I'll take that bet anytime. 
I used to run wells at CNRL at uh, half a joint to one joint of fluid. Um, and uh, as far as I remember, I never had any wells that I that I uh, caused uh, pump issues with downhole. So uh, you it it can be done. It takes a somebody who's dialed in. It takes somebody who is focused on the job. It takes somebody who cares about production. So uh, it can definitely be done. And it's not just me who's doing this. There's there's various operators out there that are doing a really good job at this. And uh, once again, kudos to them for for caring enough, uh, because there are other operators that don't care um, that I've ran into who have absolutely piss poor operations in their field. And uh, all I can think of is how do I buy these wells? How how do I how do I get this field myself? And then and then I can optimize this uh, better. Uh, so you know, hopefully sooner than later. I'll have an update on that as well. Uh, so what are the typical rates? So service rig, five to $8,000 a day. I'm talking conventional Alberta, uh, even up in Grand Prairie area, five to eight to $10,000 a day. Wire line is about $5,000 a day. Um, while slick line is $5,000 a day. Uh, did I talk about, um, yeah. So uh, a steam truck is about uh, $175 an hour. Pressure truck is about 125 to 150 an hour. Uh, and then of course you're paying for everything else on top of that. So water disposal, you're paying for whatever a fluid that the pressure truck brings. And you're also paying for service to site. This site that you that you see in this picture right here, one hour and 30 minutes from Grand Prairie minimum, minimum. So you're paying $225, $250 minimum one way every time you call it out. Make sure you you have a good field operator who's not calling out pressure trucks any time that they just want you know something done. Optimize that. If you have one job and the well is making one barrel per day, maybe it can wait until you have two or three jobs lined up, and then you can use the pressure truck for the entire day. So, you know, it it was a fun job operating. I'll tell you this: like I I had a blast because my engineering brain was able to optimize every single thing, you know, to the best of my capabilities uh, and the best that I thought in various factors around the wells, the services, uh, the production operations, the maintenance schedule, uh, the de-waxing, all, all sorts of things. It was, it was a pretty cool uh, kind of critical thinking, problem solving um, job, I guess, in a way. I mean, I, I ran my own company, so I was not really employed by anybody uh, but at the same time, I was with one uh, operator, Modern, for for about eighteen months. So, um, yeah. And I think for anybody that's looking for more on that, I do have a video on my YouTube of uh, a uh, uh, what's the name for it? Uh, a GoPro video uh, that I took on my side by side. It's about an hour long video, and I just am narrating on top of that about life in the oil field and 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 things that we're seeing as the video continues. Uh, <laughs> so there's a comment here about speeding up wells because of the uh, fluid level um, that that the pump then had problems because there's a foamy oil column. So absolutely correct, Robbie. Uh, there there's a certain phenomena where if you have a gassy oil that you're producing, you might hit a second uh, a fluid shot uh, hit, let's say, because you have this oil and then you have this foam per se which is oily gas pressurized. And so it it, it looks like a, a hit on the echo meter, but it may not be. So so you keep speeding up the pump and lo and behold, one, one day uh, what happened, the pump efficiency went to zero. Uh, we can't pump anymore. The pump won't hold uh, pressure. Oh, well, uh, time to get the rig out and uh, you know fix it up. So a mistake that I think everybody has made in the oil patch. It's it's uh it's not something that's rare. It's just something that happens uh, as you go towards blend of optimization and risk aversion and runtime uh, as well. Here are some tools that can be run on the sick line. So here's your D-wax knife. You can see how it's a solid steel with these pr uh, pricks on the side of it, or um, not sure what the right word is, I guess. It's, it's these steel... Uh, a bars per se, and they scrape the wax as they go uh, in and out of the well bore. This is your gauge ring. So this is exactly the size of your tubing. It goes in, it pushes all the, 
all the sand and wax and everything down the well, and then you can bring it back up. And then you have other uh, sort of different sand cups and uh, different tools that are fishing tools. There's tools to pull plungers. So the tool will go in, grasp onto the plunger and then pull it up. So all kinds of tools, a uh, very sweet, sweet little operation uh, that can be ran. And, and then these are your gauge rings, different sizes because tubings come in different sizes. Uh, two and three eighths and two and seven eighths are your kind of common sizes uh, up in the Cardium, Grand Prairie area, uh, along with many of the other fields that are out there. So a few of the latest technologies, you've seen the multilateral horizontals, multi-lats as we call them, that are being uh, uh, implemented by Baytech, CNRL, and other companies. You can see the, the horizontals. We hope to stay within a much cleaner zone now than the other horizontal that I'd shown uh, earlier. And we have, looks like, some sort of uh, downhole devices as well here. Uh, uh, in this zone, you can see that this is a stacked pay. So the Manville Group in Lloydminster is a stacked pay. There is zone upon zone upon zone of oil that is in there, uh, really helping out with sometimes the economics of, of some of these wells uh, when they go in horizontally uh, and, and extract this. You, you see the very famous, what I like to talk about, the, the Sparky Zone is part of the Manville Group as well. Uh, along with many of these other ones that I've I've operated wells in almost every zone here uh, over over kind of the years uh, I would say so almost all are oil bearing uh, not in every well but in certain parts of the heavier oil medium to heavy oil complex that has now transformed into these fishbone wells and egregious looking multilaterals. Uh, the technology is still relatively new, so we are still working on this. The Lycos Energy that just went uh, public, uh, LCX, they are using this fishbone pattern very effectively on their new wells. So you are seeing certain new participants take some risk on, and when they discover something good on an engineering standpoint, it will then be implemented across the rest of the industry as well. So uh, keep in mind, now that this technology is, is out there, and even though we have good oil pricing, doesn't mean everything is optimized fully. We're still looking at new drilling patterns, new kind of ways to extract the most reservoir. And uh, I think there's gonna be some, some pretty good discoveries uh, as time goes on over the next couple of years in not just formations, but different ways to drill uh, and different uh, drilling kind of patterns as well uh, as, as time goes on. Here, here are the multilaterals uh, that I showed earlier, um, you know, looking more and more common, let's say, yeah, on, on Petra Ninja these days. Um, so let me just finish this part and then I'll get to your question, Robbie, and then uh, we can continue on with the water flooding uh, part of it. So here is two other ways to extract oil. So I'm, I've been mostly talking about conventional and unconventional so far. Uh, when we look at shale, here's what they do. They go into the source rock and they frack it with huge amounts of water, huge amounts of pressure, and they create permeability in your source rock. You once again see kind of the, your usual um, oil and gas reservoir. You have your source rock, you have your cap rock, and then you have your sandstone kind of trap. Uh, and there could be traps on top of the sandstone depending on uh, where, where the rest of the rock is. So that's shale in a nutshell, nothing too crazy except the fracking portion where they jam chemicals and water and uh, sand into the well. I'll, I'll talk about shale here in the next slide. Here's your oil sands. So you have your injector well uh, right next to the producer well. It goes in, it, it circulates steam, it heats this bitumen, the bitumen gravity feeds down into your producer well that's within the steam chamber. And then you get this, this production, consistent production of oil. The reason why some of the oil sands wells have low declines is because your steam chamber continues to get bigger and bigger. And you have this constant flow of oil uh, and, and unrecovered bitumen that's coming into your producer well uh, as time goes on. So very nice, very shallow, relatively cheap. You can see oil sands wells are like four or 500 meters deep. Conventional wells could be up to three, four kilometers deep, 
in certain cases, uh, most of the conventional oils are six to uh, 600 to 900 uh, to 1500 meters deep uh, in, in most formations. A little bit more on shale. What do these fractures actually do? They, they, they literally fracture the rock. That's why they call it hydraulic fracturing. And when the rock splits, the sand that they pump in actually keeps that rock open. It's a very straightforward process. You're, you're cracking open the rock and then you're, you're using sand particles to jam in there. The rock strength is not enough to crush the sand further than it already is. So the, uh, I think I lost the Twitter space or no, we're good. So um, the sand basically just keeps your crack open. That's it. And oil and gas is able to flow out into your well bore. You produce it up. What happens over time? The sand also gets produced because there's oil and gas pushing it into the well bore as well. And your fractures close, you lose pressure, the well uh, effectively dies. That's why shale has such a high decline rate. You can only keep these open so long under high pressure, high temperature uh, kind of regime while you're trying to also flow against it perpendicularly um, and they close. And there you go, you, you get this decline rate on shale, which can you frack it again and reopen those? Sure, but uh, do you wanna pay five to $7 million to refrack it? That's up to you to decide as a, as a shale producer um, kind of going forward. Uh, one quick note, world record for longest oil and gas well, uh, Adnock just beat the record, 50,000 feet. 15 kilometers horizontally, almost eight to nine miles horizontally that they've drilled. So technology is coming a long way. We're able to sustain higher pressures, higher torque, uh, higher horsepower on some of these rigs. Um, just think about that. You're, you're drilling down kilometer to three and then, and then 15 kilometers uh, horizontally. It is a engineering marvel uh, as time goes on. It's also what's allowing us to explore further offshore in places where we couldn't earlier. Um, and then, yeah, just, just one more on fracking. You know, we, we don't want to frack into groundwater. So there is various layers of protection that we use so that the fracks don't, don't go uh, up to the groundwater. And just in general, the depth difference is too large for there to be any communication anyway because you have the casing protecting on the vertical side and then the horizontal is thousands of meters difference and fracks don't propagate uh, to that extent. Here's your American shale revolution. The light is, a, is your conventional oil. The dark is your shale oil and shale gas. You can see how shale has become the majority of the production and it's expected to continue to be the majority of the production based on this graph. Uh, of course, everybody knows my view on uh, why that cannot continue to the rates that is being projected here. But at the same time, this 2020 number is accurate as to how fast shale has grown. At the same time, conventional oil is declining uh, in the US. Uh, okay, so a couple questions here. So what software did you use for field data capture at Modern? Um, I think we were still using PBR, like like way old software. Manual uh, entering into the the books, let's say we would do our own production accounting in the field level. Uh, we would fix things, uh, of course, uh, as we go as well. So we would have the hours downtime, what the well is doing, any comments, et cetera, uh, on top of that as well. And uh, you know, Modern was a great company because it was it, it was a private junior company. So there was no nobody telling me what to do every day. There was no specific routine that I had. Uh, I, as a call it consultant uh, per se, or or on a contract, uh, had full reins to do whatever I wanted. Uh, as long as my production was looking good, uh, I would call my own service rigs. I would, uh, yeah, not quite service rigs. I would call my own wireline. I would call my own production optimization. I would run my own chemical scheme. I would run my own wireline optimization, uh, slick line optimization. Uh, we would operate our batteries and compressors at, at our set points. Uh, the new wells would be brought on based on how we wanted. So 
you know, it's really nice when, when the field staff uh, call it, have that flexibility, because in a lot of cases, the guys on the field, the guys and gals out on the field uh, have a much better understanding of the day-to-day as to what's happening uh, than somebody sitting in Calgary or Houston making a decision. So uh, nice little operation there. Uh, really enjoyed my time for sure. And I'll be sharing more pictures uh, as well as, as sort of we go on uh, uh, on that. So, but yeah, definitely uh, if you are operating the field, you also have to do paperwork and the book work to make sure everybody in the organization is on the same page as to where we are. So at what pressure does fracking occur? Uh, I don't exactly know what pressure, but I'm assuming tens of thousands of PSI is what it takes, pounds per square inch. Uh, to compare, your um, tire is like 35 PSI. So I'm talking tens of thousands of PSI to fracture rock. Uh, keep in mind, this rock is multi-kilometers downhole uh, under the ground with all that overburdened pressure on it. So it takes a lot to crack this 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 nut open uh, from there. So how do they steer the drill to go from vertical to horizontal? So um, yeah, it's basically a gradual process. You have a kickoff point, you'll slowly go one degree, then two degree, then three degrees, and then build this nice curve and um, yeah, kind of uh, uh, just, just go through that. Now, your, your casing and your tubing are never going to be completely, you know, even or uniform. The pictures can show it that way, but there's always going to be dog legs. Certain parts of your casing or tubing is going to be resting on one of the sides. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm not sure what you mean by, is it that thin? But, but basically casing is usually five and a half inch, four and a half inch diameter. Uh, tubing will be two and a, a two and three eighths inches diameter um, usually is, is, is kind of what I've gotten used to operating anyways. Uh, so how do they tell the drill to turn one side or the other? So they actually have uh, motors on the, on the drilling bit itself that, that can move side to side. So you're not telling the entire drill pipe to move from on top. Yes, you can do that in certain cases, but there's also motors right next to the drill bit, which can move it right at the bottom slowly and gradually, which then of course, as you start building the hole that way, the rest of the drill pipe will follow uh, in that direction into the hole because I mean, where else is it gonna go, right? Uh, path of least least resistance uh, for sure, but it is a little bit difficult to visualize, but, but there's a motor right by the drill bit, which can move it, there's also certain things you can do on, on the top by applying pressure certain ways or a different kind of rotational speed um, that can change which way you're, you're going multi hundreds of meters uh, downhole. Um, okay, so let's get started on water flooding here. So before I do, a uh, quick reminder, anybody on the Twitter space that would like to join for the Zoom, uh, whitetundra.ca. If you scroll to the bottom under events, uh, the Zoom link is in there and you can follow along with the visuals with us as well. Okay, so we're finally at the enhanced oil recovery part of this. So I uh, spent a lot of time on the basics, but I think uh, it's something that I wanted to talk about. It's something that I think the viewers will appreciate understanding before we start getting into complex topics uh, without understanding the basics as to how things work. And let me tell you, the, the biggest bonus that's cheap or free is production operations optimization. You don't need to run water flooding schemes, polymers, and all this. You can, if you just effectively optimize your current operation, some certain pools can increase production by 15, 20, 50, 100% uh, in certain cases. So that is probably your best way to start uh, in a bullish oil cycle start optimization on that, and then get into the enhanced oil recovery uh, sort of portion uh, uh, of things. Um, yeah, so, so certain drilling rigs are powered from, the, from, from surface where they change the way that the, the forces that they apply on the drill pipe that can make it go a certain way or the other. But the more accurate way would be to have your your, I believe it's called a mud motor. 
if I'm not mistaken, uh, down hole, which is right on top of your bit. And it can, it can give the bit different directions to go to uh, and make it very, very accurate uh, as to where we need to go. Um, yeah, and then the other system, I believe is called a rotary steerable system where the entire drill pipe decides which way you're going uh, depending on the pressures and, and uh, volumes uh, that you're pumping through the bit uh, and then back up. So um, yeah, there's no one answer. One is cheaper, one is more accurate. What do you want depending on which rig uh, kind of you're, you're operating and, and where you're drilling? So um, I just wanna make sure on the, on the Zoom, the mic is working properly. So I assume it is, uh, but if I can get close or anything, if it helps, uh, but if not, I think this is working good. So uh, I think we'll just keep, keep it as is. So, um, okay. So we got uh, water flooding, okay. Water flooding, the most simple enhanced oil recovery. You have your injector well, you have your producer well, you push the water. The water goes where it wants to go, path of least resistance as usual. So you might have these patterns that develop. Effectively, you're trying to push the oil. Um, oil never exists in pools like this that it's showing. This is just a diagram to show you how it works. Oil is going to be between the rocks. So imagine a big layer cake and there's, there's oil channels and pores within that rock. So um, there's this kind of misconception that, that almost seems comedic to even have, I have to explain, but, but oil is not like a lake downhole where you just drill into it and it's this lake that, that, that pools into it. It's literally rock with oil pores and streaks in it uh, that we're trying to produce based on a high pressure to low pressure gradient um, over a period of time. So here is the same thing vertically, water injected, we push the oil into the pool. So you, you can see how the vertical water flooding is a 2D sort of push, whereas the horizontal injector is a 3D sort of push. Um, with the vertical, you have to keep in mind, water can also go in 360 degrees. So it's not as simple as, oh, if we inject here, all the water is just gonna push oil this way. There's, there's different, uh, flows that can happen depending on where the pressure spots are uh, downhole as well. Um, and then, so here's here's kind of uh, a better view. When I say oil is not a pool downhole, this is how the oil is downhole. You have your rocks, um, call it a grains. You have your oil that's going in and out, um, kind of stuck to certain parts of the rock, depending on its... Uh, affinity for, for, for that part of the rock. Um, and then you have your water uh, that kind of picks its path of least resistance. So uh, now let me explain this a little bit more. If your water just continually is taking this path, you know, right here, well, this oil is gonna be stuck forever. So it just stays there. That's how water flood works, path of least resistance. Um, here's your core, you can do lots of core sampling and lab test that can give you some understanding as to the flow pattern of your actual water flood. And another thing to keep in mind when you're water flooding is that your water can actually react with the clays and create this, this jagged pattern uh, on, the, on the grain itself or the clay itself, which further restricts the oil from moving because your water is coming in at this angle and it just, aerodynamically just glides over this, this, this oil droplet instead of bringing it along with it. So many factors to keep into mind. This is not just a, oh yeah, we'll just put a water flood in, we'll inject water and we'll get oil. It, it, it doesn't quite um, work uh, quite like that, but uh, lots of factors. It's a very technical art. It's not as simple as that it's a dynamic art in that you must continue making adjustments uh, as time goes on. Uh, and you can kind of see the scale that they're putting here, uh, millimeters and uh, yeah, I'm not exactly sure what, what the scale is showing, but uh, either way, this is very, very zoomed in uh, as to what it's trying to show here. 
Um, okay, so what are the problems that can occur as well with water flooding? You can have water coning. So here's your vertical producer. You're pushing water in from the bottom. Uh, and what do you get? You get this cone pattern because water has a better flow regime. It has an easier tendency to flow. And it's also denser. So it can push other things out of the way, um, which you might need, but also can be a detriment. So here you have a water coning. The water has preferentially decided to flow into the well bore. But what do you need to do? You either move your pump higher in the hole or you let the water flood relax and let it settle down and then re-inject to make sure you're not producing this high water cuts uh, that can come out of this. And this is why when, when we look at some of the fields in Saudi Arabia and we say, oh, we must re, uh, relax these fields. That's exactly what it means. You can't just produce your max capacity 24 seven, 365. You can do it for a month, but you do it too long and you can create a permanent preferential flow patterns, a downhole, which can impact your effective ultimate recovery uh, of, of some of these wells and of some of the pools. Here's the same thing shown different way. So, you know, you can actually have the cone that can go into your perfs and then all you'll produce is water despite this massive bank of nice juicy oil, money-making oil uh, is green for a reason is how they represent oil because uh, it creates a lot of money uh, uh, just sitting there while you're producing this water, which is effectively a cost uh, to you because you have to process it and dispose of it. Uh, very little real use of it. Um, and also keep in mind, a lot of wells have gas caps. So as you pressure up the oil, uh, the gas will be here kind of on the top and, and gas, uh, is, is of course a compressible, uh, more than liquids. So, um, it, it can create other patterns, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's, it's not as simple as, oh, we got oil and we got gas or, or oil and water. There's, there's other things that can occur when you introduce water and pressure into a uh, formation. The other problem that can occur, water channeling. So if you have a new water flood and you're saying, yeah, you know, we're gonna do good here. Let's, let's jack up the injection rate uh, and, and push this oil. Let's get some really good oil, uh, oil numbers. This is what you're gonna create. You're gonna create water channels where because you pushed it with so much pressure, you added too much energy to the system the water found a easy way through rather than you slow playing it and pushing this, this, this bank of oil uh, as time goes on. So I've seen this happen before. This is the worst production operations in enhanced oil recovery you can have is just continuously increasing injection pressure uh, as a way to solve kind of your, your production being low. And once this happens, you are in, a lot of trouble. Like now that the water has found the path, even if you shut the well off uh, and, and relax the field, that channel might still stay there as a low pressure sort of area uh, where water is preferentially flowing. So what do you do? Well, now, now you really got to think about uh, some of the things we'll talk about later on here, uh, some of the other uh, EOR metrics or you just produce your oil as a skimming operation at very, very low oil percentages. And maybe that's still economic to you uh, in an older field uh, per se. On a new water flood, if this happened, um, I would not be a happy camper uh, as, um, you know, as an investor or as an engineer working on, on these sorts of things uh, and having this happen uh, or somebody telling me that, that this is what happened. Here's the same in a more micro fashion. You can see how oil will flow or water will, will flow preferentially. It's what's called fingering, water fingering. Uh, it, it creates this finger-like pattern where certain um, uh, water channels are lower pressure and they start trying to look for this channeling path. And eventually if that path is wide enough, um, all your water will start flowing uh, into that. Of course, that this is as time goes on. This is not a one-day 
event. This is a multi-month, multi-year event that happens. Things uh, flow very slowly down hole, uh, contrary to kind of popular belief uh, as to how these things work. Also, we got to look at water flooding patterns. So you can't just in, uh, put a water flood injector anywhere, throw a producer anywhere and say, we're good to go. We look at patterns. Certain patterns are better for certain viscosities of oil. Certain patterns are better for certain permeabilities. Uh, certain patterns are better in late stage water flooding. Uh, some are better in early stage water flooding. So we have a line drive pattern, very popular pattern in the past. Uh, we have a, a deviation of that, which is your staggered line drive pattern. You can see injectors and producers in lines. So triangles are your injectors, circles are your producers. Line drive pattern, staggered line drive. We have these five spot patterns where you have injectors pushing into a production well from 360 degrees. You have a small pool, three spot pattern, two spot pattern. You have a peripheral flood. This is similar to what the Gawar field in Saudi Arabia, uh, the granddaddy of oil fields is. It is a peripheral flood. You have all your injectors in the center in this cone-like fashion, or you have all your producers in the center in this cone-like fashion, and you're pushing water, not just into the middle, but also up into this, this, this conic a trap sort of pattern. Uh, you have your nine spots and, and all kinds of patterns. I'm not even going to uh, try and go into it. Uh, they have certain benefits. So um, depending on the viscosity, depending on the permeability, and depending on the existing recovery factor, certain ones are going to be better. And, um, you know, something if, if, Anybody here uh, works in the industry, you have access to production engineers uh, who are looking at water floods within uh, uh, one of these companies. Just ask them, why, why are you running this kind of pattern? What's, what's the science behind it? And uh, perhaps some people know the answer. Maybe, maybe it's just, uh, maybe the answer you'll get is, oh yeah, that's just how we've been doing it for, for decades. And so that's why, that's just how we continue. You know, maybe an optimization opportunity there in a hundred dollar plus oil environment to fix up the water floods uh, and and get better production, especially because all these patterns are vertical well patterns. If you now introduce horizontal drilling into this, um, you have even more kinds of patterns uh, that could be way more economic. And why, uh, if my companies that are that I'm invested in uh, come out with a news release tomorrow, hey, we bought this water flooding pool. Uh, a water flooded pool with 10, 15% recovery factor, I am happy. I'm, I'm jumping for joy because, hey, amazing. We have the oil already there. We have a low recovery factor. We now get to use new technologies. We now get to use horizontal injectors and producers uh, as well uh, to, to extract more of the oil that might be already stuck in oil banks here within the pool. So again, some people like to see the optimism in these things and uh, the the realistic geologic uh, phenomena that's occurring and, and that can occur in a higher oil price environment. And uh, some people just like to bash everything. So, um, you know, it's up to you. Who who are you trying to listen to um, as the cycle sort of continues? Um, because I think making acquisitions like that at two to three times cash flow, um, if I had the money, I would do it myself. So... I think that goes to show why I'm so supportive of, of, of the companies I invest in uh, making those sorts of acquisitions. A little bit more on water flooding. I, I said there's these patterns and all this. So how do we figure out what happens? Well, we can run reservoir simulations and modeling. It's not 100% accurate, but you can run different modeling based on core data, based on logging data, uh, based on reservoir simulations and different parameters of the models you put in here. This model, for example, is telling you what is going to be the oil recovery and the water cut under different injection volumes. So if you inject this many barrels, this is what your water cut is going to be and your oil recovery factor is going to be. Injecting more water is not always the solution, nor is injecting at higher pressure always the solution. You see, for example, look at this red line. This is a time varying sort of curve. Uh, they've, they've injected different volumes at different parts of time. 
you can see how it starts off as being the best oil recovery method. But once you've injected about 40% of your pore volume, it, it drastically drops off uh, to be almost uh, fourth place, like by, by quite a margin. So um, this comes back to my original point. Certain companies have optimized their pools to show a lot of production upfront, um, when in reality, they're suffering longer term consequences because of their actions of developing not just individual wells, but also enhanced oil recovery uh, schemes in that sort of, uh, 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 call it uh, engineering, look forward uh, development plan. Same thing with the water cut, same thing with these, uh, call it, uh, this is a five spot pattern that they're talking about. So four producers on the side, one or four injectors on the side, uh, one producer in the middle. It can also be run the other way, uh, which is, this is an inverted five spot. So you have your injector in the middle and four producers on the side. Uh, very cool science behind this and the way that this water flows preferentially uh, certain places. And um, it's, is anybody paying attention to that? Because what you could have is one of the wells waters out because of channeling, a good production engineer will shut that well off and let the water flow into the other wells and push the oil, let the one produ a production well relax and let it sit there. And I can tell you that uh, I can go on Petro Ninja and pick out small little water flooded pools uh, where one well is just making all the water. That's where the water's flowing. Uh, the, the, the other production wells have, have had their oil rates drop off and nobody's paying attention. It's, it's sitting in a large ENP company that nobody's watching this all that carefully and, or, or sitting in a junior company where they don't have the money to do anything. And it just sits there. It sits there and uh, could be making a lot more money, a lot more production, a lot more cash flow. Uh, okay. Right on. Um, yeah, I will be talking about MEOR as well. Yeah, later on. Uh, yes. Um, do the injectors use the water underground or others? So um, the, the, the injectors actually use mostly recycled water. So once you have your water flooding scheme going, any water you pull out, you just run it through your system, inject it back in the, in the uh, injector wells, and uh, off you go. The well is just a recycling mechanism. And if you need more water, you usually have a source water well that can pull water out of uh, existing water aquifers underground and add to the uh, uh, volumes that you're looking to um, sort of uh, uh, inject to keep the water flooding voidage ratio uh, going, which I'll talk about here uh, as well. So another thing on the patterns, if you have this sort of geologic phenomena, this, this coning oil trap phenomena, you want to use the, uh, what was the name of this one? Uh, the peripheral flood pattern, as I discussed, a la Gawar, the Gawar field in Saudi Arabia. If you have this sort of oil trap, you want to use your line drive pattern. So it's not as simple as just what the reservoir parameters are. You have to understand what the geology is and what kind of trap are you in. Because if you start using line drive uh, a pattern on, on this conic oil, what's going to happen? You're not, you're not going to get the right uh, sort of recovery factor. You're not going to get the right water going in the right places. And you're going to leave oil stuck in these, in these banks that you can't access. So uh, always want to dive deeper into. Uh, I love looking at this. I'll, I'll look at a uh, pattern of water flood. I'll see what kind of pattern it is. And then I'll go and look at the geology and, and see what do they match up. Well, in most cases they do because people are not just doing, you know, stupidity and going out and putting any kind of pattern, but, uh, you know, maybe some optimization in there now that time has sort of gone on uh, uh, for a while. Uh, okay. Um, uh, okay, so let's get to some real examples here. So here is a... Uh, 
uh, surge water flood. Uh, this is a surge energy Wainwright pool, a uh, small pool. You can see it's a line drive slash staggered line drive pattern in a sense. You can see it started in the 1960s. Production went up really fast and then it declined. Uh, green is oil, blue is water, red is gas. And then you have water injected as well here. Uh, or sorry, I've, I've taken gas out actually. Uh, this, this, this orangey line is your water injection. So, you know, field was kind of dying out, nothing was happening. And then they start injecting water in 1976. Oil production went up more than 10x, almost 50x. And over the call it years, it's gone down, you know, 80%. But I'm talking a 50 year period in which it declined 80%. Shale wells declined 80% in 12 months. You, you see why, as an investor, I prefer water floods and long life assets rather than unconventional shale assets. The other thing, look at the decline rate over the last 15 years, zero. It's effectively zero. There, there is no decline rate. That's how these water floods work. Once they get down to a certain level and you get into this skimming, recycling oil operation, your field doesn't decline. It, it may decline 1% a year, 2% a year, which can be made up with other optimizations uh, or workovers. So what you have is effectively a zero decline asset uh, here. And, um, you know, operating really nicely. The water flood looks to be operating good. You know, nothing much, nothing much here to think about. So this surge pool is part of the greater Wainwright water flood. So this little pool, I'm not sure exactly where it is here, but, but it's one of the parts here. You can see how they're suspended and abandoned parts of the pool. This is the abandoned wells. Uh, this symbol, the dots are the active wells, and then the arrows are the uh, injector wells. So uh, you can see, and then some horizontal drilling also happening on this side of it. So Surge owns about half the pool. Uh, uh, Synovus owns about half the pool. And I'll show you the difference now between the two. two. The Surge part of the pool over the last 15 years has looked really, really good. Very little decline, not much happening. They're they're producing the oil, whereas the Synovus part of the pool um, stuck in a large GNP. Do they care about a two thousand barrel per day asset? Do they care about a five hundred barrel per day pools? Eh, maybe not. It doesn't get the same attention. And look at the overall Wainwright water flood production has dropped off significantly uh, in the last call it three years since COVID hit. Sounds like an opportunity maybe for, for somebody to go and buy the rest of the pool from Synovus uh, and, and optimize it just a little bit better. Uh, there could be other issues that are happening here, which, which I, I, I haven't really focused on, but you can see how the injection rate also has dropped off, which means there possibly was some serious issues uh, on the injection side of things uh, uh, on the Synovus part of the pool as well, which uh, they haven't fixed or they refuse to fix at this point in time. This is not a dig at Synovus. This is me saying these pools get stuck in large ENPs. They don't get the attention and creates for a really good opportunity for other people to come in and buy these pools, optimize them, and bring them back to their former glory uh, with just water flood. This pool has a 35% recovery factor solely on water flood. They didn't do any sort of other injection schemes here, and they got to 35%. So when people ask me, well, this company only has eight years of, of a 1P reserve life left. Okay. Are they a water flooding company? Yes. Uh, okay. What are the, the proxy pools next to them? What, what recovery factor did they get to? Um, well, they got to 35%. Okay. And this is me, me portraying a, a two-way conversation. Uh, uh, okay. So what is their a recovery factor of your pool right now, 15%. Okay. If you look at the reserve evaluators, what recovery factor max are they giving the company credit for? Um, up to 20%. Okay. The pool next to it produced 35%. So 
is there any significant geologic difference between the two pools? No. Okay, so you effectively have a 30 year water flood still remaining. It's just the way that reserves work that they won't give you credit for that until you produce another year. You produce another year, you get another year's of reserves. So not only does the pool not decline in terms of physical barrels, your reserves don't decline, yet you make one year of cash flow every single time the reserves get updated at the end of the year. Therein lies the case for why um, I invest in these sorts of companies as opposed to other sorts of companies uh, that are out there targeting shales and, and other high decline um, sort of non EOR assets. Um, okay, so I'll leave it at that. There's other things to watch on water flooding, of course. Uh, we want to make sure our produced barrels is the same as our injected barrels. If the injected barrels is a lot more, you have a thief zone that's stealing low pressure. Uh, that's a low pressure zone that's stealing your, your water injection. If you have produced more than you've injected, then you have a existing water flood and aquifer water drive uh, formation already that's naturally occurring. So things to keep in mind as a reservoir engineer, as somebody running reservoir model, all you plot is water injected versus fluid produced. So you, you want this exact straight line, a one-to-one -one almost ratio. The reason it's not going to be exactly one-to-one -one sometimes is because your oil and gas or, or your oil and water can actually expand when they come out of formation so there's a formation volume factor that we must use because oil and, and water are slightly compressible. And also if gas comes out of uh, oil on surface, it's taking away from part of the volumes there as well. So uh, we need to take these things into account, the volume factors. Uh, of course, they're not gonna make a massive difference, but they make enough of a difference that it's worth, it's worth keeping track of uh, if you're a good, good ENP company. This is the calculation. Your VRR, voidage replacement ratio, which is your injected volume over your produced volume. Here is the formula. And, and you see we have these uh, water formation volume factor. We have gas for, uh, formation volume factor and oil formation volume factor. And then you have all kinds of ratios and stuff that go into this. And lo and behold, you get a equation that you solve um, this is what we learned at uh, in my petroleum engineering program at the University of Alberta. So we learn how to do these sorts of calculations, ensure that your water flood is running properly, uh, and there's no sort of issues. So what can the issues be? If your ratio is less than one, you're losing pressure. Your water flood is not operating at max efficiency. You're losing pressure in the formation. You're not properly pushing the oil. You have an inefficiency. If your ratio is more than one, you might think higher pressure is good. No, it, it, it could be good in a short period of time, but you could fracture the formation. You could literally increase the, the pressure so much that one of the overlying rocks, uh, cap rock fractures, uh, or, or you get some sort of other collapse in the formation um, because pressure got pushed a certain way. So definitely one to keep in mind. Um, and again, for that to happen, the, the voidage ratio must be much greater than one, not 1 1.1 or 1 1.2. Like, like it must be 1.5 to two, and, and then you're running into serious problems. Um, we also have instantaneous voidage replacement and cumulative voidage replacement, very similar to steam oil ratios. There's a, uh, a immediate and a cumulative. So, um, you know, over time, we want our, our, our I, IVRR can be up for short periods of time, but over time, you don't want your, your voltage ratio to be way over uh, one by any means. Uh, okay, so yeah, the Wainwright field is a, is a great proxy. Like that is what a water flood can do solely on that. And uh, one thing I will just point out, there's no horizontal wells in this entire core of the water flood and they still produce 35%. Now there's other water floods that are much lower recovery factors that could be optimized with horizontal drilling. What does it tell you about what kind of recovery factors we can get to 
in the next 20 years or the next five years or the next 10 years compared to these ones? One to perhaps think about uh, when, when you're looking at reserves uh, on your companies. Uh, okay. Um, so there's another question here on water scarcity. So no, there's, there's, there's going to be no problem with water scarcity for water floods. Um, it's not even something that, that I, I, I appreciate the question, but, but it's not something that's going to be a problem. So, uh, we, we don't factor it, um, because so, so, so let's say typical water flood, right? Let's say, uh, it's using, and I'll talk about one here soon. So, so maybe just hang on here a sec. Uh, when I get to the Macklin water flood, I will answer a question there, uh, Ian, as to as to why it's not a concern. Um, and I think, yeah, we're not far from it. So a couple of the work that production engineers do with water floods, we have the Chan water oil ratio plot. So you plot water oil ratio. You also plot the derivative of water oil ratio against time. And depending on the patterns you see, you can see coning, you can see channeling, you can see multiple channeling, you can see thief zone, and you can see high to a uh, high water cut, normal uh, water flood. Very simple to do. All you need is Petra Ninja. You, you take the wells in the pool, you take the water oil ratio and you plot it. And then you take the derivative and you plot it. Chan plots, we call them. They tell you if your water flood is operating normally, or has issues. I'll just put it this way. Certain companies are doing a really good job at their water floods. Certain water floods, maybe not operating bad, but definitely can be optimized. Um, opportunity where oil can be increased, OPEX can be reduced. Um, we also have the haul plots. So we have Chan plots and we have haul plots. Uh, the haul plot uh, plots, on the x-axis, you have cumulative water injected. On the y-axis, you have pressure. What should you see? As you keep injecting more and more uh, water, your pressure should stay constant. Um, so what is happening here? So this is actually pressure multiplied by time. So not, not just pressure because it, it, it shouldn't be going up like this. Uh, pressure multiplied by time. So this should be a straight line. If you are having pressure problems, you could have fractured the reservoir. If you are having too much pressure all of a sudden, you could have a wax buildup that's causing a localized issue near your injector well. Time to fix it. So these plots are very well known. They don't need to be memorized. I bet you most production engineers have them memorized, but they have very clear, distinct signs that you're having a problem with your water flood. Uh, here's the pool, the, the surge pool that they just bought from Enerplus in the Provost area. You can see how it's a relatively new water flooded pool. It doesn't look like this one, you know, fully drilled up. It's still relatively new in its phase. And there's some horizontal drills now happening. And production over the last two or three years, Enerplus has not done a good job. It's not one of their core assets, so they don't care and they let production drop. This is a logarithmic plot. So this drop is a pretty serious, uh, significant drop in production in the last, call it five or six years. Looks like opportunity to me. I, I won't beat a dead horse. I'll just leave the plot there. Uh, and you can see why there's an opportunity here to bring things back up to normal production. And then the pool itself is still very, very early in its overall recovery. Uh, and, and can be impacted with, by horizontals, not just verticals. Here's the Macklin pool. So this is a pool that I operated for Prairie Thunder Resources in 2018. Uh, I worked on this pool, very nice, heavy oil, sparky, and a manville pool. You can see the water flood on this and how it's working. So um, just, just to give you an idea now. So the question that was asked, this is in terms of barrels produced and barrels injected. This water flood right now is injecting about 25,000 barrels per day of water. The loss on that water is sub 1%, you know, maybe 1% at max. 
So you're effectively needing 250 barrels per day of new water source in order to keep your water flood running. 250 barrels. One frack in the Montney, one well in a fracking operation in the Montney uses 200,000 barrels of fresh water. So each well that's fracked in the Montney is using three years worth of replacement water for an existing water flood. You can see why it doesn't matter. It's, it, it's not a problem to source water uh, for water floods going forward. Um, and you can see what, what Prairie Thunder has done. This, this might shock some people. This company is producing more oil out of this field today than the max rate that was produced in 1981. That's how effective horizontal drilling can be, which Prairie Thunder just started in 2018, 2019, 2020, uh, when I was with the company then. There's still large parts of the pool that are undeveloped. There's, there's large parts of the pools that don't have injector support. Just look at this map. These top four producers here, the black dots, where's the injector for them? Right here. It's pushing water 360 degrees from there. It's most of it's going to, to the south. This entire north part of the pool is completely non-water flooded, non-horizontally drilled. What do I think is coming if I'm looking at this as a production engineer, let's say? We're going to drill in the top part of this pool horizontally, and we're going to go with this, this pattern. One injector, one producer. One injector, one producer. And we're going to make lots of oil. We're going to make lots of money. It's as straightforward as that. I see it because it's things that I'm looking for. Um, and I think uh, something that investors can watch for. When companies make acquisitions on water floods and EOR pools, I immediately go and see, okay, what's the recovery factor? What's the closest proxy field I can use? Did they do horizontal drilling? Are all the injectors captured within the current patterns? Where is the latest drill and how much production is it making? Do they have oil banks that I see here that are going to be targeted in a higher oil price environment? If the answer is yes to a lot of those questions, you, you're you gonna do really well in a higher oil price environment. Um, and I repeat this point because it applies to a lot of the companies. When you have something like a water flood, there's a fixed cost. As your barrels go up, your number of barrels go up, your dollar per BOE OPEX keeps coming down because you, you still need only the same injection pumps. You still need to clear the snow going into your battery, no matter if you're producing one barrel or 5,000 barrels. So it's a double whammy effect. In a higher oil price environment, companies generate more net back because commodity prices are higher, but also if they can produce more barrels, the dollar per BOE or barrel operating cost comes down there's a higher delta there, which means you can generate even more net back out of facilities that were dealt, uh, built to handle much higher volumes in certain cases uh, of oil and water and injection capacity. So green is oil, I'll repeat, um, 15 years of zero decline, literally zero decline, 15 years. Um, no, no shale well can say that, uh, not even close. And a lot of the offshore wells can't say that. And a lot of the other wells uh, uh, in other parts of the world, the recovery factor is too high for them to say that. So hence why the opportunity, I think, remains in Canada, uh, a relatively ignored part of the world conventional oil scene, um, despite its prolific uh, reservoirs. So one final comment on water flood uh, is that the clear water is now adding water floods to their development. Relatively new area, you can see how Tamarack has so much open area yet to develop, and they've gone to this trident pattern. Three legs of oil, one leg of water. And they're using this pattern, and, and look at what's happening. They didn't even wait for the pool to produce uh, initial uh, primary, uh, primary recovery before they went to water flood. And the well is producing more now than it did for its IP, IP 180, let's say, even more. 
the economics on Clearwater wells are already such that they pay out three, four, five times in the first year. They can pay out up to 15 or 20 times in the first five years. Early estimates. Now what happens if the water floods start working really, really well? And, and your production looks like this. What happens when your cumulative oil per section estimate goes up from 600,000 uh, barrels per section to 1.4 million barrels per section? More cash flow, more reserves, better economics, lower decline production, nice juice to be squeezed out of a very preliminary new field with lots of development upside. I'll leave it there. Um, okay. Well, one more comment I wanna make on that. Even with the water flooding, the recovery factor that they get to is only 12%. What happens when they start applying some of these other techniques here that we'll discuss, possibly testing them out and possibly some of them are successful as time goes on. Uh, of course, all of this is only possible in a structurally bullish cycle, which allows for some creativity and money spending and non-risk aversion, uh, some risk taking, some spending some dollars for exploration and development uh, 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 out of the box solutions. And guess where we are? Guess what we're looking into over the next few years? Uh, okay. How many sections is the Macklin water flood field? So, um, five. Maybe five. It doesn't even look like five sections. Maybe three, three sections. So, it's not a very big pool. And um, yeah, like I could see all my wells if I stood at the battery. I could see about 50 to 100 wells from there, see that orange a sign on top, see if my PCPs were spinning uh, or not. So nice little pool uh, for sure. So yeah, and then and then this, um, where is it? This pool would be what? Uh, six sections somewhere in there. Better for horizontal is if you have the 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 more sections, hit the outsides of your pattern, um, this is a relatively smaller, shorter horizontals. Uh, although I can't really tell from this map properly either. So um, yeah, okay. So we're about two and a half hours into this. Um, where are we here? So part of me just wants to power through and get this done. So I think uh, let's do that, yeah. And uh, maybe then then we can uh, wrap it up and do a very short Q&A uh, today um, and kind of leave it for, for the following weeks. So, and we've been having some really uh, decent detailed Twitter spaces anyway. So uh, lots of opportunity to ask questions uh, over there. So, um, okay. Uh, one quick reminder, anybody on the Twitter space that would like to join for the uh, Zoom visuals, whitetundra.ca, scroll to the bottom under events uh, and the Zoom link is on there to join for the visuals. Uh, if not, feel free to continue uh, listening in and uh, enjoying the commentary, uh, I hope. Uh, okay. Oh yeah, there was a few other questions that I missed. So, um, yeah, so you can recycle the produced water and re-inject it. It's, it's, a, it's a very efficient operation. 99 plus percent of the water makes it back. There is certain parts of the water that remains in the reservoir. Think about it. If you're producing oil, you have to replace that oil volume that you took out with water volume. So, so you are gonna lose certain parts of your, your, your water. In a lot of cases, it's sub 1%. So that's the point I was trying to make. Uh, and yes, it is flow lines that go to injector wells. Yes, they do freeze up. Yes, they do crack. Yes, they do rupture. It is a pain in the ass when it's minus 40 out, out there with a the steam truck, trying to figure this out, get your injection well going. Uh, the, these injection wells in Macklin were at 6,000 a KPA, so about a thousand PSI of pressure. This is some legit uh, pressure that's going on here. So not not something you just play around with, uh, and you know mosey around. Th this is some legit, uh, a fun high high pressure activities uh, happening here. And uh, yeah, so each well could have its own battery which produces oil, or they can have flow lines where they pump the oil 
uh, into your main battery, and then there's a collection area there. So it all just depends. In the Macklin field, I had about 60 to 80 wells on flow line. I had about 10 to 15 wells on single well because they were just too far from the battery uh, to justify a pipeline or a flow line, especially because the oil was heavy. So you don't want to have long pipelines exposed that you're trying to pump heavy oil through. It will freeze, it will wax off, it will corrode, and will create asphaltines uh, as well as well as scale uh, in your pipeline. So uh, are these fields better mapped now? Is there any bouncy pressure in gravity flow? Um, where is the free water? Was it free free water limit? Um, Sorry, I'm just trying to uh, keep up with all the engineering stuff and the acronyms that the oil and gas industry uses uh, and the transition zone. So once again, there's no simple answer to your question, Jad. It is it, it is a, depending on the pool, some fields are better mapped with 3D seismic. Some are still doing step out wells. Uh, some we know what the flow regimes are. Some we don't. Some are optimized on the patterns. Some aren't. The transition zones aren't all that well understood in my opinion. Uh, water flooding is a very technical science and art. Uh, it's not easy. It needs multiple months and years of understanding, uh, even specific pools, before you really know where the water is going. Uh, so I think there's still optimization opportunities. I, I don't think things are well understood or well operated or well engineered uh, as an aggregate by any means. Uh, is the royalty... Is the royalties deferral mentioned on the last slide a CA wide policy? Um, oh yeah, I forgot to mention this completely. So this is a Saskatchewan brought in some sort of program to push for new water floods and they were giving them a royalty credit. Uh, I'm not sure if it still exists, but um, hey, you know, come, the, the governments themselves realize where the opportunity is. So they're not stupid, uh, especially the Saskatchewan government is really got their hand on the pulse as to how to create more royalty income, more production and more productivity for the province in various commodities. So definitely a good job done by them. Uh, obviously starting with Brad Wall, who was the head of, of, of really paying attention to these sorts of things uh, for many, many years. Um, yeah, so the free water level, um, I'm assuming you're talking about the water oil contact uh, underneath in possibly an aquifer kind of water dry formation, um, those are well understood, yes, because there's so many uh, different drills across the pool. We know how the water is moving up and down uh, in different parts of the pool uh, as far as the uh, injection and, and where the water is going. That part is a little less understood, especially because it's dynamic. If one well channels and you get this preferential flow, it can affect the uh, production of the other wells uh, as well. Okay, polymer flood. So when water flood does this fingering pattern, what do we do? We put in a layer of polymer. Yellow is the polymer. And why do we like polymer? Because it doesn't break through. It doesn't go through oil the same way water does. Polymer is a rubbery material. It's a higher a chain molecule. So it finds it hard to flow through these small openings that water can. And when you push polymer with water, you get the intended effect. Uh, why? Because water cannot flow through polymer for the same reason that polymer cannot flow through oil. Amazing, it's, it's, it's nice that this exists, right? So something that we might see more and more of depending on upfront CapEx required uh, for the polymer uh, should be a nice little boost, I think, to some of the older water floods to install polymer right here. You have your oil, you got your polymer, and you have your water. Very simple process. The only difference, like I mentioned, is because it's a longer chain molecule, uh, it, it, it can't bypass the oil, and then you use the water as a pressure mechanism because polymer is hella expensive, uh, and you don't want to be wasting polymer uh, if you don't need to. Here's another way of describing it. You see how the water has channeled. Now you inject this polymer, and you get a really nice uh, a flow regime. Here's the same thing on a uh, inverted five spot pattern. So the injector in the middle, you see how you got preferential channeling all over the place. Here's your oil bank. For those maybe who couldn't visualize what I was talking about, this is your oil bank right here. 
and here, and here. Now, when we push with Polymer, we get to access all these oil banks and uh, you know get them to our production well, which is what we want, cash in the bank, right? As soon as the oil comes out of the ground, that's cash in the bank. When it's underneath the ground, um, you don't have that money yet. So, uh, okay, here is uh, why Polymer works really good after water flood. So you get your, your initial recovery, you get your water flood, and you see what's happening here. You're, you're losing some uh, uh, oil here or some water here into this zone. And then you put in the Polymer and it gets you a much better pattern. You still have oil that's going to stick to rocks because of their affinity to the rock. But the more polymer you inject, the more and more you recover every single time. And this is sort of how it works right here. Uh, if you add your nanoparticles to the a polymer. So when you add the nanoparticles, they're small little particles that can go and almost like a like a chisel, maybe. They go underneath, they, they use themselves as a lever, and they push the oil uh, off the rock, therefore uh, bringing it into your production well. So uh, I think you'll see more and more about nanoparticles going on uh, as, as time goes on. It is still not an exact science. Uh, certain nanoparticles work in certain formations. Certain nanoparticles will permanently damage your formation. So depending on what they do down there, uh, you could have pretty lasting impacts, uh, negative impacts, as well as positive impacts. So it's not a part of the industry that people should be, uh, I guess, just in my opinion, uh, doing without significant field uh, engineering and significant field trials on that reservoir uh, before they implement these sorts of other technologies uh, per se. So here you go, here's the exact difference. On one side, you've got a water flooding. On this side, you've got polymer flooding. It's a more uniform displacement front. That's it. It's as simple as that. Um, polymer is expensive. It needs capex up front, which is why it's not as popular as water flooding. Uh, but you know, hopefully, in a higher capex environment, uh, should be here going forward. Especially because the Saskatchewan government, I I believe, still has a huge royalty credit for uh, installing polymer floods. Um, and here's one of the floods that did it. This is the Baytex Laporte pool. Uh, I'm I'm only showing the last, call it, a few years of, of production. Um, you can see how the, so um, where is it? Um, this is your polymer injection up here. Uh, in pink, you can just kind of see it on top of the, the blue line. This is your oil rate, uh, and then your gas in red. Uh, you can see how the oil rate got to a max, and then it started dropping off. And then now it's on its recovery phase in 2022. So Baytex has brought this pool up from 325 barrels per day to 750 barrels per day in the last 12 months. And they're just getting started. Remember, polymer has a leg. When you inject polymer, it takes a while for that front to move and bring the oil to you. So now that they're re-injecting huge quantities of, uh, quantities of polymer, expect that oil production to go up and continue to increase this is a pool with very low recovery factor, uh, lots of possibility here uh, to keep production higher and higher from this you know, lull standpoint. And uh, look at the years. It's not hard to uh, kind of understand what I'm trying to say. Capitalized in 2010 to 2014, the boom years, fell off a cliff in 2015 to 2020. Now you have the opportunity to increase production massively in our next part of the cycle uh, with huge amounts of low decline production available. Baytex Laporte uh, is the name of this pool for anybody looking uh, for further sort of information. Um, yeah, Braden makes an excellent point. Uh, plenty of fields have optimization potential, uh, older wells with new technology that could squeeze more barrels out. The drills are already there. The wells are already there. It, you just need to optimize them in the right patterns. You can convert producers to injector wells. You can convert injectors to producer wells. Kind of swap up your patterns. Uh, the wells are already there. You don't need to drill. You don't need to do anything. Uh, it's a relatively nice cap a capital efficiency uh, on these projects. And yeah, 
that is the game plan for many of these smaller companies that buy the uh, quote unquote boring or wasted or undercapitalized uh, assets, the non-core dispositions that people keep talking about. Uh, really nice opportunity in, in some of these pools. Okay, CO2 flood. Weyburn, we're talking about CO2. We have to talk about Weyburn. You can see the production profile. And this is about, uh, what is this? Uh, 55 years that you're seeing here. Primary and water flood. You have your, and, and this is all vertical drilling. Now you have your vertical infills. Then you have your horizontal infills. So you can see how it extended the life of the pool. Another 15, 10, 15 years, just horizontal infills. And now CO2 EUR, we have production back up to 1975 levels. Very nice. Great job by the, uh, well, Pan-Canadian team. That then was the Encana team. That then was the Sonovis team. Now is the Whitecap team. So uh, great job by them uh, doing this so far. Production still today is about 23,000 barrels per day, 23 to 24,000 barrels per day. Uh, very nice. Uh, very huge pool, over a billion barrels, original oil in place. Very nice pool. Uh, lots of money to be made. Lots of money has already been made. And the CO2 has given it uh, extra few decades. Not, not a few years, not a few months, extra few decades of cash flow and reserves. How it works? Very similar to polymer, except it actually dissolves in the oil. So the CO2 is injected. It sees the oil. It goes into the oil. It makes it easier for the oil to flow. It reduces its uh, viscosity and uh, allows it to flow. It pulls it off the rocks uh, because it literally goes into the oil. And then this oil front, call it, moves, which once again, you push with water. CO2 is also very expensive uh, to source and inject. So uh, we do want companies to push it with water as a pressure mechanism, uh, not CO2 itself. Um, at, at at any period of time for that matter. Here's the Weyburn plant. So when you run CO2, it's not the same as a water or polymer injection. You do need actual uh, multi-million dollar facilities to recover the CO2 uh, and also deal with all the other issues that get created. Uh, when you inject CO2, you create scale, you create corrosion, you create dirty water, uh, you create lots of other uh, wax and asphaltines. So you do need a full processing facility uh, to, to, to recollect that gas and fix up all these issues. Weyburn is also a sour field. So the gas that comes out of that is sour. The oil that comes out of that is sour. There's one building I remember when I used to work in Weyburn where the gas that was in that building was like 300,000 ppm of H2S. So yeah, that means if there's a hole the size of a pin, you're dead, that's it. No point even thinking about it. Uh, around 500 PPM will kill you. So 300,000 PPM, it's a sour field. You do need lots of uh, different uh, kind of facilities. Think about it, CO2 plus H2S, deadly combo in terms of uh, the kind of hell and havoc it can create on pipelines and facilities and downhole, but also make lots of money for you. Win-win. Uh, yeah, win, 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 I guess, if, if you can get it to work on a large enough scale, you can make lots of money while dealing with the other parts of the problem. Here's the Weyburn facility from up top. You can see how there's uh, tanks, oil tanks, there's water tanks, there's injection skids, uh, flare stack looks like in the back there. Nice little operation. Uh, I spent the summer of 2015 here. You can see uh, me here, a uh, young uh, my first summer in the oil patch actually was in Weyburn. Uh, we were doing lots of maintenance work. So we would switch out packings. We would switch out shivs, uh, change up belts on pump jacks. Uh, we'd install these cattle guards to make sure none of the cows were up there scratching themselves against the wellhead and, oh, uh, just, you know, undo a valve or something. And all of a sudden you got oil leaking all over the place. So we we definitely don't want to let any animals uh, into this space. Uh, we did lots of other jobs around injection wells of CO2 and diesel and water. Um, great summer. And sour gas, you really had to be careful. 
lots of things that can be very dangerous. So, you know, you kind of learn quick, but uh, hey, the way in the oil patch to learn is to get thrown into the wolves. And uh, if you survive, then you're uh, kind of ready to kind of uh, start your career in the oil patch. So uh, there's definitely an, an element of that uh, in the oil and gas industry. And, uh, you know, let's be honest, not not to pat myself on the back, but a lot of people don't make it. Uh, it's it's a very mentally challenging industry. Uh, lots of money at stake, lots of egos at stake, lots of production at stake. Uh, there's danger, of course. Uh, everywhere you go, high pressure uh, gases and different uh, compounds that can kill you. Uh, but, you know, the, the industry has, has done a, a good job keeping things safe and making sure their workers have a really good understanding of the dangers uh, and the risk profile that exists. So, um, yeah, I've got other pictures as well uh, from the Weyburn field. So maybe in a future uh, presentation, I'll share more uh, of those as well because um, just a fantastic time and gorgeous country out there in in, in Saskatchewan, uh, Weyburn area, pool, uh, a tiny little lakes and ponds with with the freshest water uh, and 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 the greenest grass uh, kind of everywhere uh, you go. And uh, yeah, it's it's only when I started working there that I realized that uh, cowboys are still a real thing. So, you know, you'd, you'd be driving around and you see this this guy um, and they're always for some reason uh, built, um, you know, completely ripped and they'd be on a horse and 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 with a hat on and, and moving cows around. And I'm just like, am I living in a movie uh, or or what's happening here? But that is the way of life uh, out there um, in 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 rural Saskatchewan, let's say, and uh, lots of oil to be produced. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so there's a few questions here. Um, how much of the injected CO2 stays in the reservoir? So a part of it does stay in the reservoir, uh, which I guess is good and bad because you can get credits for it possibly, but also it's expensive. You don't want all of it to stay in the reservoir. So I don't know the exact number. Uh, I would guess 15%, 10, 15%. Uh, I know I know we had to keep renewing our CO2 stock uh, every single day because we'd lose a bunch of it uh, down hole. Does it provide carbon credits? I honestly don't know the answer to that. Maybe that's a future thing that can make money, but um, the operation itself is so good economically that I don't think it matters whether you get carbon credits or not. It's just a cherry on top which maybe the cherry is getting bigger and bigger as time goes on. Um, <laughs> yeah, my clean, my clean shaven youth. Yeah, this would have been uh, 2015. So I was uh, 19. Yeah, in, in this picture, I'm 19 years old. So uh, yeah, lots of, uh, lots of things have changed since then, lots of learnings. And uh, I guess that's, that's what the interesting thing is about life in the oil patch. I guess it's, it, it's not one path you work in different uh, areas, you work in different kinds of wells, different kinds of um, uh, uh, pressures and temperatures and zones and reservoirs and different scenery, work with different people in different parts of Canada. And uh, yeah, it's just a fascinating world. I mean, this this is literally the Wild West that uh, people in the oil patch who 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 I guess call themselves explorers or, or wildcatters, uh, you know, used to dream of and, and still do. So you want to be out there where the action is uh, and kind of learn learn from the people that are doing it day in, day out. Here's the Weyburn Field. Uh, it's over a thousand wells in the Weyburn Field active right now, uh, producing about 24,000 barrels per day. That just goes to show that each well is not doing that much, but uh, as an overall field, it's doing really, really well. Here's the overall field production uh, to date. You can see how very shallow decline rate, looking very good. Um, I think I shed a tear that that Sonovas sold this. I don't think they wanted to, um, as as I think has been discussed on a few spaces. Uh, this is a, a, a crown jewel asset. Um, yeah, and I think it's, it's at least Canada's biggest CO2 sequestration project, uh, if not North America's, uh, maybe even bigger, I I can't quite remember, but I'm I'm pretty sure it's Canada's at least biggest uh, CO2 sequestration so far uh, that they've done. Here's another summary: CO2, water, your miscible zone, 
where the CO2 is merging into the oil and then you have your oil bank that goes into your production well. Primary, secondary, tertiary. Looks very similar to the Weyburn production profile I showed earlier. And when we say enhanced oil recovery, in many cases, people like to remove water flooding from it. So they say there's improved oil recovery, which is water flooding and others. And then enhanced oil recovery is after water flooding. Um, this is one thing about the oil patch that they love their terminologies and acronyms and uh, patterns, different unique names for everything. So if you're wanting to learn more about these things, I think uh, really, you know, something that you're just gonna have to deal with. There's there's acronyms for everything. There's terminology for everything. Uh, and things can sometimes get confusing within themselves. Here's one in the US, 2 billion barrels of oil in place. And uh, you see how production was declining. It would have declined like this, but because of CO2 injection in red, it now has this decline pattern. This is of course, 30 years ago. So uh, looking you know, really good as to what CO2 can do. It can basically arrest decline right there in a very short period of time. And what did they do? They recovered more than 120 million extra barrels uh, over a, call it 25 year period. 120 million barrels times $50 net back a barrel. Of course, they didn't get that back then. I'm talking about if a field can do it right now, going forward, 120 million barrels over a 25 year period, uh, six uh, at a $50 net back per barrel, $6 billion over 25 years, about $250 million a year of extra cash flow uh, that's coming into the company. No, no company in Canada has a 2 billion barrel field that can be used with CO2, uh, a, a singular project, but certain companies are getting there if you add up their fields and cumulatively them, how much uh, barrels were in place originally and how much extra they can produce over the next kind of cycle here uh, as time goes on. Here's another similar kind of uh, graph. You know, it, it really helps oil production when you can get your CO2 uh, online and it's an incremental effect as time goes on. So it doesn't just happen one day, you wake, uh, wake up and your production 3 x No, it's over a gradual increase as that oil bank moves and is produced. And then you have your second CO2 injection and then your third CO2 injection that bring oil with it. Uh, as time goes on. And you also have to adjust your patterns on CO2 uh, quite regularly uh, to make sure you're, you're, you're getting all those oil banks in the right places. CO2 EOR production in the US. So you see how uh, this is millions of barrels per year. So in 08, about 250,000 barrels in the US was CO2 produced, uh, CO2 injection produced. Canada, we're about, uh, call it 15, 20,000. So lots of upside still in America and in um, Canada. The one difference, of course, American conventional oil has got a lot higher recovery factors than some of the Canadian pools, just given how heavily they were uh, developed in the 1980s, 1990s, and even the early 2000s uh, in the past. Only certain reservoirs work for CO2. So there's this kind of concern that, oh my God, if CO2 comes online, it's gonna affect our supply thesis. Well, it, it could on the margin, but there's very few reservoirs that work for CO2 injection. They need all these criterias, uh, depth, temperature, pressure, permeability, uh, gravity, API gravity, uh, viscosity. One thing to note, uh, CO2 doesn't usually work below 27 API. So every medium to heavy oil field out the window right there. Uh, you, you've already taken out a lot of uh, Canadian production that could possibly, uh, possibly be put under CO2 from the suitability uh, equation. So just keep that in mind uh, when you're thinking about how much supply can CO2 really add, a CO2 injection really add over the next little bit. It can't add a meaningful amount to overall production. It can add a meaningful amount by far a meaningful amount to certain companies that hold those assets. Here's some of the economics around it. Uh, you can see 
the capital cost is going to be about five to ten dollars a barrel over the cost of the project. Uh, your CO two cost is going to be about fifteen dollars a barrel uh, for each barrel you produce, and then your your normal opex is ten to fifteen dollars a barrel. So, what you're looking at is about a twenty to twenty five dollars per barrel extra cost to produce with CO two, and you can see why these projects didn't go through during 2014 to 2020 downturn and why they are such a nice opportunity at 80, 90, 100 plus barrel oil uh, because, hey, they produce and they produce for decades as long as you can eat the upfront CapEx and then the $15 per barrel CO2 cost is manageable. Um, hint, hint, certain companies are working on ways that they can recycle their own CO2 uh, to use in their fields, which takes away this $15 per barrel extra OPEX um, something to keep in mind for certain companies. Um, major US CO2 operators, not surprised to see Oxy at the top of this list. I don't think anybody would be surprised. I've been saying for about six months to a year now, the reason Buffett is buying Oxy specifically is for the CO2 injection and CO2 sequestration uh, and capture potential. Here's your proof. In 2008, Oxy was producing more than the next four operators combined in terms of how much CO2 uh, injection production they were producing. More than the next four operators combined. And uh, I've gotten a few, few questions and pushback on this thesis. And I'll just, I'll just put it this way. I'm not trying to be right. I'm just making a, a deduction based on what I see. And there's no answer as to whether I'm correct or not until many years in the future. So. There's no real point arguing about it, um, but I do like it as a discussion topic because um, why why does he prefer to buy 28% of one company rather than you know a, a few percentages of a few different companies uh, when you look at CO2 potential, not just for excess production, but also excess um, uh, sequestration at a time when carbon credits are getting worth more and more. Yeah, so Robbie makes an amazing point here. So primary reason why America has higher recovery factors is because they have lower, a lower operating cost. So everything there, uh, for the most part, on the aggregate is more tapped out. Uh, but what happens in a $80, $90, $100 oil environment? If your OPEX is 50% more than US or 70% more, you still get a pretty decent looking margin on, on that barrel. So uh, I agree with you, Robbie. And just to comment on top of that, is uh, it really needs higher oil uh, oil pricing to make these projects work. And uh, I'll just say from my perspective, that's what I'm looking at in the future. Uh, if, if I didn't believe in that, why would I be in the oil and gas investment space to begin with? If I thought oil is going to be 70 for the next decade, I'll just leave the oil industry. Why, why would I try and pick companies that do good at $70 a barrel? There's no point. Uh, why would you live through the volatility of that and the constant headache uh, and political and social issues and and everything else, uh, if you didn't truly believe that prices were going higher, uh, if not right away, then over the cycle uh, as it continues on. Um, okay, so here's another one on the CO2. The gas comes in. It takes the oil off the rock. The oil is naturally has an affinity to the rock, depending on the rock it is, the rock grain. Uh, the CO2 comes in. It's immiscible. It goes into the oil. Uh, makes it more viscous, less viscous, and then it can flow through easier. You get more money, more oil. Here's the same thing shown very zoomed in. CO2, it comes in here, and then it becomes immiscible, and you, you can't even differentiate between the CO2 and the oil, which is why on the other side, you need processing facilities that can remove the CO2 from the oil so you can reuse it in your, in your uh, flood. You don't want to just keep selling CO2 flooded oil uh, as is and, and losing that uh, no matter how much low, low percentage it is. Uh, the same thing, kind of a summary slide. Here are the CO2 sources. So I just put this in there to show you that the US has a lot more CO2 sources than Canada does, which is why they're able to also produce so much more CO2 EOR. Uh, they have all these pools in Texas uh, and uh, Wyoming and whatnot, and, and even in uh, Oklahoma, which are really good. And the CO2 for Weyburn comes from North Dakota. It comes from the Great Plains Coal Gasification Plant, 
is piped up across the border into Weyburn and where it's being used. Um, just another field showing the same thing. You see primary recovery, terminal decline, water flood, terminal decline, CO2 flood, terminal decline. So this is a more recent field. This is the Salt Creek field uh, uh, in the US. I haven't followed up on it, but they are ones that actually are, are talking about hitting peak production only in 2025. So um, I'm not sure how old this graph is, so I'm, I'm really gonna have to read up on it, uh, but I am gonna be doing more, more research on CO2 floods in the US uh, because they provide good proxies for some of the projects and opportunities uh, that exist within Canada. CO2 floods are never done field-wide. They're done one by one by one. And how do you do it? You complete one part of your acreage uh, with CO2, fully deplete it, and then you move to the next part of the field, almost in chunks, rather than build your facilities out to handle the entire field, which would cost way too much upfront uh, and is just not reasonable anyway, because your decline profile would, would just not look good. It would be this huge ramp up and then decline on it, which is not what you want uh, when you're spending huge amounts of money for CapEx uh, upfront. Uh, yeah, Robbie's on a roll here. So, so he says, uh, anyone that wants to learn more, look at Enhanced Energy CO2 Flood uh, near Leduc. Uh, they are doing some work there. It's a greenfield CO2 and they're using the carbon trunk line uh, as well. And they've got eight injectors and four producers in 2020. So very new field. Uh, Enhanced Energy is doing a lot of good work with EOR uh, in CO2 and also with polymer in other parts of their uh, kind of uh, assets, which, which I think will be seen over the next few years. So a great point. Um, Whitecap also has a Joffrey field now under CO2 flood. So uh, definitely a few proxies we can use in Canada as well. Um, Denberry. So uh, this is a company I have, have, have not really tracked uh, all that much, uh, but, but it is also one of the ones along with Oxy that is really big into these uh, EOR and CO2 projects. Um, I think possibly it could get uh, a bought out even in the in the short to near term, uh, just just because of that possibility, and it's a relatively small to medium cap, uh, given where it is. So, um, yeah. Um, okay, I'll I'll finish the CO two part and then I'll get to the uh, these other questions. So, the way CO two works, the miscibility of CO two is a function of temperature. The higher the temperature is the lower the miscibility pressure you need for that CO2 to go into the oil. So the hotter you can get your reservoir, the better it is for the miscibility. You don't need to pressure it up as much. You need less CO2. So always keep this in mind when running a flood. If your reservoir pressure is less than, let's just say 150 to 180 Fahrenheit, I think you need to do may, maybe a little bit of other work, uh, possibly some sort of heated uh, of water that you're pumping in, uh, some other work that can be done. I'm not exactly sure what, but but just keep in mind, it's not as simple as just, oh, we're going to inject CO2 into this reservoir and make oil. Many, many things need to be done upfront uh, to make sure you have a good candidate field and that the upfront CapEx is worth it. Right on. Okay. Here's some other fields, San Andres CO2 projects. We have lots of information from the US. We have SPE papers on it to, to read off of. So I don't think I have any, uh, call it uh, sympathy for people who are not putting in the work and uh, possibly might miss opportunities. Now I understand these things may not be in their investment mandate. So it is what it is, uh, but, but further down the road, uh, there are going to be companies that make lots of extra barrels from CO2 injection, um, and I think will will differentiate themselves going forward in terms of their their uh, production, their cash flows, and their performance. Obviously, so I think whether people choose to invest in that or not is up to them. Uh, but but I do think the the information is all out there. It's SPE papers. It's really deep analysis. It's pictures and uh, formation information. Everything is already out there. For people that want to look at special opportunities, um, 
I always laugh when I get like an email and, and please continue sending them because I love looking at other projects. But I love when I get emails saying, hey, we should invest in uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, hey, we should invest in offshore Namibia. And I'm thinking, why? Like, if you want exploration and development risk, you have it within Canada. And the risk is very low compared to the reward. Again, not investment advice, my opinion. What is the need to go to these areas uh, and take on these sorts of uh, sort of geologic and geopolitical risk? And have I missed out some opportunities? 100%. Uh, some of the names that have that have ran in the global exploration space, but I don't know anything about them. So uh, it would be wrong for me to go into some of these names uh, on not understanding the geology or the production engineering or, or sort of how these fields react uh, to the newer technologies or whatever the companies are trying to do. Um, okay, this is one in the Permian Basin. So just keep in mind, the Permian Basin, uh, I believe, has had some really good CO2 floods in the past. And uh, there's certain names I've mentioned in the past that have good uh, um, upside and acreage in the Permian area. Conventional Permian, Occidental being one of them. So one of the major ones, let's say. Uh, not saying that I'm buying Oxy by any means, because I don't like their shale production. But uh, there is a case to be made for North American uh, conventional EOR type of projects, um, whether it's in Canada or in America. Okay, so we've got a few more slides here, and I think we'll wrap it up uh, in the next uh, 20, 15, 20 minutes. So there is a question that came up. So uh, I'll just get to that quick here. Uh, do you see the US banning exports as a risk? So this has been discussed, I think, very, very greatly for a while now at this point. Um, is it a risk? Sure. Uh, what would it do in the short term? Do exactly what the U.S. Want, uh, wants it to do. What would it do in the mid to long term is create permanent catastrophic impacts to the Canadian and U.S. oil space. Um, is the U.S. administration stupid enough to do this? Uh, I I don't really believe so, no. Um, they have picked the easy way out right now with the SPRs and whatnot. Uh, I don't think they get there. If there's any talk that it's going to happen, then we can deal with it at the time. Uh, but I do think that on the whole, and this is just my opinion, this is not any personal comment to anybody. We spend a lot of time talking about the what if situations. Uh, and I think if investors just spent a little more time looking at companies themselves and which companies are going to do better over a longer period of time in the midterm, which companies have the opportunities, uh, they might end up finding that the, the value per time spent is a lot better than trying to talk about windfall taxes in Canada and talk about uh, what happens if this happens or that happens, uh, because we've already discussed those things ad nauseum and, and there's no conclusion we're really gonna come to uh, until we have some real information on the table uh, to deal with it. So. They make for fun discussion topics, uh, and I appreciate you bringing that up uh, for sure. But but I really I don't know how you come to a conclusion that you are happy with and that and that you feel like the discussion has closed. I don't think you get there right with with these sorts of open ended questions. So uh, to me, I I don't even think about them that much. Uh, if somebody has information when when it's a problem, I'm more than happy to kind of look into it or discuss further anytime. Uh, but on the whole, I feel like the conversation goes in circles a lot of the time, um, and we end up coming to no conclusion other than a he said, she said uh, sort of thing. Uh, but but once again, do appreciate the question uh, there. So other EOR floods and recovery methods. So we have NGL override. So certain companies, they didn't want to do any of this. So what did they do? They just took the NGLs of the gas and just started injecting that in the ground. Uh, they said polymer are too expensive. Let's just take the NGL butane propane and jam it in the ground and see what happens. And and what happened? They got more oil, of course. Uh, but what happens with NGLs? NGLs are much less dense than oil, than water, than polymer, than the Im the impact that CO two is having. So this is what you get. You get a vertical override, is what we call it. So near your injector well, you got really good coverage of your oil pool 
But because NGL is less dense, it just floats up in the formation. And the closer you get to the injector, you have this triangular shaped wedge that's left um, at your at the bottom of your pool, um, which just stays there until you go to a different kind of pattern. This is a map of South Swan Hills where they tried this NGL. It worked really good in the 1960s, I believe, in the 1970s. And what happened after that? Uh, it just kind of got left. And where did, where did they try these patterns? In very small parts of the pool. Certain parts of the pool are still open. And also certain parts of the pool have not been hit with horizontal drilling. The exact same thing that I showed you in the Wainwright water flood versus the provost water flood uh, that Surge has. So uh, here's the Swan Hills pool, the South Swan Hills pool. Uh, this pool used to make 60,000 barrels per day in 1975. The facilities are set up for 60,000 barrels per day. Today, it produces about, uh, call it 600 barrels per day. One one hundredth of what it used to produce. Water injection has continued on. Uh, other injection has continued on, but that those, those, those triangular wedges of oil that the NGL missed is in a lot of cases uh, was uh, was produced through water flood later on, but not in all cases. So that still remains. And keep in mind, this is the same flood that Penn West slash Obsidian tried the CO2 flood in that I've discussed in one of my earlier presentations. So here is the CO2 flood. 2008, 2009, 2010-ish timeframe up till 2011. They had to truck in CO2, which is highly in... Uh, ineffective and very uh, uneconomic, but the field trial was a success and $15 million of equipment is still sitting out there. So a uh, recovery factor on this field, I don't know exactly, but I would guess 30-ish percent, 30 to 35% right now. Um, other reef plays have got recovery factors as, as high as 85 to 90%. So you know, something that's interesting and, and could matter on a large enough scale. You see what's happened 2021 onwards, where we're now restarting this production increase after many, many years of decline uh, over a longer historical sort of look at it. Here's the same thing that I just said, but in a uh, more technical way. Uh, so the solvent slash NGL has this wedge pattern. It produces oil in this wedge but it misses a lot of the other wedge. And so we need to inject more different kinds of uh, compounds and gases in order to recover the rest of this oil, which is effectively a stuck oil bank. And this is not just me making up stuff. This is the Journal of Petroleum Technology, uh, I believe is what this stands for. And these are people from Shell and Woodside that have written these papers and they've done uh, calculations They've done modeling, they've done simulations, and they're using real world data. And anybody that wants to read this, just take this title right here, put it into Google. It's a free, it's a free, I believe, uh, PDF. And you can read the entire thing as to why this is such a nice opportunity in uh, some of these pools that, that still remains. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, so so this is the Swan Hills area. Yeah, so there's there's various there's various um, operators in the area. CNRL, Conifer, uh, uh, Conifer obviously through through the Excel Energy bankruptcy, um, uh, uh, Razor Energy as well is is quite active in this area. Um, um, yeah, so so you can't you can't just make the injector deeper because you have to inject within the same formation as well. So. Uh, as far as I know, nobody's tried that. Um, and it wouldn't matter anyway, because you see how fast the NGL goes up. Uh, the problem is that NGL is maybe 0.6 specific gravity, oil is 0.8, water is one. So, so there's a big gap there. Uh, if the NGL was a heavier, like a condensate, maybe it could do better, but butanes and propanes, they, they'll just migrate up right away. Um, gravity, that's the power of gravity. Uh, yeah, so the, so the light stream wells are not in the reef portion of Swan Hills. They are on the platform portion of Swan Hills. So it's not the same. It's not the same 
uh, upside they have. Uh, they they might have the same water flooding characteristics, but but they don't have the same call it juicy reef pattern uh, behavior uh, either, and 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 a lot more expensive because remember the Swan Hills is like three thousand meters deep, so quite expensive wells. You really need the big juicy oil column to make it worth it, uh, which it may be now that that asset has ended up in the hands of uh, Saturn Oil, who seem to be a, a bit more aggressive in their approach. Uh, here's a Nisku Pinnacle Reef. So this is Pulse Oil. Uh, they've got these Nisku Pinnacle Reefs. They inject propane and solvents into the wells, but look at the way they're doing it. They're injecting them from the top and then they're pressurizing them and pushing them down. So a different way of NGL uh, injection. Uh, pulse oil is a cool one because their injection just started in December. And we're gonna see early well results in maybe late spring, early summer. We're gonna see how this Nisku uh, Pinnacle Reef is producing. And it'd be a nice little you know, exercise to follow along. It is a public company, full disclosure. I have no shares in this company. It's one I follow strictly for uh, my informational purposes. Uh, it is a name that will be added to my uh, uh, price targets list once the solvent injection starts showing some initial results, uh, because I think it is a cool company to track for, for an EOR play. You can see how how porous the NISQ pools are. You can see the the vugginess of the, of the core, uh, uh, how much open area there is, probably 30 to 40% porosity, I'm thinking here, uh, something like that. And I once again, I'm gonna to refer to analog pools. Look at the pools next to this, th these two pulse oil pools, 77% recovery factor, 88% recovery factor, 70, 85, 90, 87. Pulse two pools, 37 and 33. You can kind of see the opportunity there without even having to really, you know, understand much of what's happening. Uh, but but hopefully you understand a little bit more about what's happening and can see why it's a, it's a cool little project that should be able to recover the same amounts of oil as their analog proxy pools, which are what, two miles away, three miles away, um, you know, from there. Yeah. And, and just to reiterate, this pool is already at a 35% recovery factor. So they think they can get it to 75, 80%, uh, which is very similar to how other reef structures are right now in terms of their recovery factors as we speak. Here is the Virginia Hills pool. So I'm gonna talk about, now we're in the other, other EORs, other recovery factor methods, a portion of the presentation. The Virginia Hills pool used to produce 10 to 20,000 barrels per day. It produced that for multi-decades. And then they had some pipeline failures, which resulted in production falling from about 7,000 barrels per day in 2000 to 1,000 barrels per day in 2010, and now producing about 200 barrels per day. Look at the pool as it is. Lots of wells that are still suspended. Very little horizontal drilling on the edges, which is going to play into your NGL floods and water floods. And you have uh, the two pipeline failures that resulted in production just flatlining for the last, well, production falling off a cliff in the last 10 to 15 years. And it became an asset that got stuck in major companies. They didn't care for it. Nobody had the money to recapitalize it. Then 2014, 15 happened. And the rest is history, as they say. I'm more of a forward looking individual. Uh, so you just look at the map and, and how the wells are. Look at where the water injectors are, or more importantly, aren't. Look at where the horizontal drills are. Um, you can go into Petro Ninja, look at the production profiles on these new drills uh, and how they've performed. And you can see kind of where we are and where we possibly should be in a bullish oil price environment uh, uh, in these sorts of fields. So, so when I talk about EOR, we started the presentation talking about production operations and bringing the wells on back to what they used to produce before we even discuss EOR. This is why. There are pools out there that have not been capitalized for multi-decades with hundreds of millions of barrels still in place yet to be recovered. Um, so I'll leave it leave leave that one at that. 
A uh, couple other things that can happen, steam injector. So we can inject steam in certain cases, not SAG-D, but actual steam into the well. Uh, this happens a lot in California, in the San uh, Joaquin Basin, I believe is, is how you say it. Uh, uh, a lot of these steam wells, the government of California, a state of California recently put a uh, stop on this, but hopefully restarts because there is a lot of bonus oil left in California, millions of barrels billions of barrels that are left in California uh, still to be recovered. Uh, if the government even supported them by 1%, you can see once again, there's a shale cap rock, which brings us back to the beginning of the presentation. You always need an imp impermeable cap rock to have an oil sort of zone underneath it or on top of it uh, for that matter. We also have what we call huff and puff schemes, different kind of EOR. You can inject gas. When you have a gas oil reservoir, what will happen is the gas will, will start flowing into your well bore. Or sorry, you, you are able to, um, let me repeat, water will start flowing into your reservoir because of the way the water oil contact is. So you say water, oil, gas, like that on top of each other vertically. What you do is you inject gas into the, the exact same well. You, you start injecting gas what it does is it creates more gas volume, which pushes your entire reservoir down, both oil and water. And then what you do, you then start producing the oil once your oil is to, to a low enough level that it's back at your perfs or at your pump. You produce that for a year or two or, or a few months, and then you run the huff and puff again. This was very popular in the Eagleford and in the uh, Texas area in general. It's something that's not as, as common in Canada, but it's called the huff and puff EOR uh, scheme. Um, okay, how much more do we have? So we got a few more slides here. So um, one thing to keep in mind when you're running water floods and any other pools uh, EOR, what emulsion are you creating? A spontaneous emulsification is going to create this sort of emulsion. Emulsion just means mixture of oil and water. What you're going to get is water with these oil droplets. That's what you want in most cases. If you add too much energy into the system, you will get these water droplets within oil. And, you know, depending on the field you're in, you might want to run a extra a high energy emulsification. But in most cases, you want the spontaneous emulsification where you have these oil droplets, which you can then produce in your surface facilities. Another thing on higher pressure, what if your rock looks like this and you have these droplets, big size droplets stuck beneath the rock? Do you want to jam this with high energy? No, because unless the rock fractures, you're not going to get this oil molecule through this, this poor throat here. So things to keep in mind, this is what reservoir engineers spend all day doing. They try and figure out what, what is the oil left in the reservoir how can we produce it? What's the best method? How are we gonna produce the most of it? Keep in mind, just because your recovery factor is the highest doesn't mean that's the most economic way to produce that reservoir. You could have three or 4% less recovery factor in a reservoir, but do it for one tenth the cost. May make more sense, right? So bigger is not always better uh, in terms of recovery factor in, in your pool. Um, okay. I also wanted to make a quick point on solvents and chemicals because uh, somebody wanted me to talk about this. So this is what solvents do to oil. If you have a waxy crude, you dip it in solvents. The solvent acts as a uh, sort of lower uh, carbon chain oil. It can dissolve the heavier, uh, longer carbon chain molecules. Simple as that. We also have what we call dispersant chemicals. So the dispersant chemicals has a lipophilic tail and a hydrophilic group. What does it mean? Lipophilic means attracted to oil, lipids. Hydrophilic means attracted to water. So you get this kind of molecule uh, thing, compound that we inject into the reservoir. Um, so you see how the tail attaches to the oil droplet, the water uh, uh, a ball, I guess, on top attaches to the water. And you get this oil molecule with a shield around it uh, in exactly this fashion. 
And what do you do with it? This is used on in, in this way for oil spill cleanup. Think about it. You have your oil molecule that's now protected and it conglomerates. So now you can easily clean up oil spills. When you work it the other way around, what you happen, uh, what happens is that the water drops out of the oil, which is nice when you're trying to sell clean sales oil. A lot of pipelines will only take less than 0.5% BSNW, bottom solids and water oil. So um, you need to get your oil cleaned up with these water molecules. And we use dispersants for that matter. We inject them in our flow lines. We inject them in our tanks and we get the water and oil to separate to 99.5 plus percent um, accuracy. We also have inhibitor chemicals. And what inhibitor chemicals do is they latch on to certain parts of the wax or asphaltines so that the glob of wax can't get as big as it would have without the inhibitor. And I used to run all these tests all the time up, uh, up at Modern. The wapitycardium is a notoriously waxy formation, lots of paraffinic uh, 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 material within the oil. So we used to run, run a lot of these tests and, and field trials and whatnot, uh, change up our systems all the time. But this is effectively what it does. With no inhibitor, you, you get these massive wax molecules that plug up flow lines and tubings. When you have the inhibitor in there, it doesn't let you do that. It also changes the temperature at which wax will drop out. So it uh, increases the temperature, uh, call it, at which the same level uh, of wax is going to drop out uh, once you have the inhibitor in your, call it, emulsion or solution. Yeah, so so this is the uh, with the inhibitor and this is uh, without the inhibitor. So at the same temperature, you're gonna have a less wax content in your oil uh, with the inhibitor and looked at it the, the, uh, the other way for the same wax content. Uh, yeah, you can read the chart both ways. So at, at the same wax content uh, with the inhibitor, you're at a lower temperature as opposed to without the inhibitor. Uh, it's happening, what is this graph showing? Uh, yeah, so either way, at the same temperature, you have lower wax with the inhibitor than you do without it. That's it, That that's the main way to look at the graph. I think I'm diving too deep into it. This is the way that you would run a, a PT graph, pressure temperature graph on it. So you have your bubble point where the gas comes out of the liquid. Uh, you have more wax formation on this side. Uh, you got less wax formation. Obviously the hotter your fluid is, the less wax that should form just because wax doesn't like uh, hotter temperatures, it, it usually dissolves or melts. And this is what you have when you have this dissolved wax that comes out, um, you know, hopefully um, you can deal with the problem before it hits your surface facilities and plugs up flow lines and pipelines and, and, and your separators and whatnot. It is a massive headache. So it's better to do uh, inhibition or solvent work down hole than it is to try and bring all that wax to surface and then deal with it and it becomes an even bigger problem. Uh, here you go. This is one of my Wapiti Cardium wells right here. This is the tool that the slick line attaches to the tubing. And that is solid two and seven eighths uh, tubing paraffin. That's it. That's all that was coming out of the well. It's straight paraffin. You can see how that's a significant problem to allowing oil or water or gas to flow. Um, yeah, this is all paraffin wax, uh, n just a nightmare problem, especially because wax gets worse when it's colder out. Guess when we don't really want to, you know, work, we don't feel like working when it's minus 40 out. That's when the most wax drops out even more of a problem. So it's always fun in the oil and gas industry because when it's the coldest, you get the most problems. Therefore you have to work the most when it, uh, when it is minus 35 or minus 40 out there, uh, Celsius, of course. Uh, but yeah, this was our Grand Prix well. This was uh, four of nine, I believe. Uh, for anybody that, that maybe wants to track it uh, online, four of, uh, four of nine, 68, 60, 66, eight, um, W6, I believe. Uh, so 
yeah, pretty cool stuff uh, with Wax. We also have a new technology with MEOR, what's called microbial EOR. So they put uh, wax eating bacteria into your well. Uh, they go and they eat the heavier chain uh, petroleum, carbon, the heavier carbon chains, which then allows the rest of the oil to flow much easier. It reduces its, it, uh, its viscosity. Relatively new technology, not as proven. I have never found it to work in any of my wells, uh, but, but the science around it does make sense uh, as long as the bacteria doesn't eat other things. So there's been cases where the bacteria starts eating the casing, it starts eating the, the, the steel in the pump, it starts eating the rubbers in the pump, and you get this nightmare situation where there's this uncontrollable bacteria downhole and uh, certain wells have had to be uh, abandoned because of this. So just like nanoparticles, we want to be very careful with microbial EOR. It's not something to just throw into any well because you could have serious consequences. And for anybody that's seen bacteria grow, um, the things can multiply 100x in a matter of hours. So you don't want that in your formation. They, they can literally eat all the oil in the formation in a certain part uh, if you don't restrict their growth with, with other uh, ways. Uh, but but cool little thing, right? You you got these bacterias, microbes uh, that you throw down hole and they eat away because they're organic. Uh, oil is an organic compound. They eat away the the heavier chain um, molecules. So pretty cool stuff. And and this is a case study that they did uh, in I'm not sure where exactly, but uh, production was up 200 percent according to them. And uh, one one that. I hope in the near future, I uh, maybe get to try on, on one of the wells uh, in one of the companies that I'm invested in uh, as a case study, obviously after significant DD and uh, engineering work goes into that. A um, little bit more that, that nothing, nothing is same in terms of reservoirs. You see how uh, both sandstones and diatomite are in the same area in California. One has double the porosity one has one thousandth the permeability, but they both have the same initial oil saturation. You have to produce them different ways. Sandstones are produced with 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 uh, your uh, 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 horizontal fracks or or conventionally. Diatomite is is produced through steam injection because of the lower permeability uh, and the much higher porosity. Very similar to oil sands. Here are the same under microscope. You can see how the the void space aka porosity is much lower in the uh, sandstone, still really good. Whereas the diatomite is basically fully void space, but a lot less permeability, way less permeability. Here is some of the wax that comes out of some of the other wells. This is the Uinta Basin uh, in Utah, an upcoming basin, which is why I, I refer to it. People talk about Uinta Basin, Production has gone from 40,000 to 80,000 in a year. Uh, is this the next Permian? I mean, you tell me if if your oil looks like that, solid wax on surface at room temperature, can it produce the same as what the Permian does? The, there's definitely a limit to it. This is literally shipped in rail cars exactly like that as a solid. Uh, very interesting stuff here going on. Uh, for anybody that's into solvent chemistry and into the chemistry in the oil field, this basin is just fascinating. Um, and they have pore points of 90 and 120 degrees. Pore point means this is the degrees at which the oil stops flowing um, kind of at all. So 90 degrees, obviously this is Fahrenheit. So uh, call it 35, 40 degrees Celsius, it stops flowing. Anything below that, it is a complete solid. Uh, pretty cool stuff, and they produce 80,000 barrels of that uh, from the stacked pay as we speak uh, in Canada. Uh, Oventive is a big producer in this area uh, right now. One of the other things we can do is oil upgrading. So we see this in the oil sands. We also see this now in new technologies coming out that can upgrade a lower API oil into a heavier, uh, into a higher API oil, which is obviously uh, less viscous. So, um, you know, some of the heavy oil upgrading technologies are going to be interesting ones to watch going forward as well in, in some of the heavy oil fields uh, within Canada. 
Um, yeah, so the, the Virginia Hills oil field is, uh, I believe, 100% owned by Razor Energy uh, at this point uh, in time. And wax is just a heavy oil, right? Uh, steam to prevent this downhole. So not, not quite, not quite. Heavy oil is heavy oil. Uh, it's just a higher carbon chain oil. Whereas this Uinta basin is a uh, wax, is it, it's an asphaltine. And um, I'm forgetting the terminology now, but, but basically what it is, is, is it is the same carbon chain molecule but but there's this thing that attaches on the side of it. Uh, I wish I remembered the word. It was it's it's one of those chemistry like compound words. So uh, maybe I'll share it in in one of the future uh, presentations. But wax actually has one of those attached to it, which kind of restricts a lot of a lot of uh, things being able to be done to the oil, uh, similar to how heavy oil can be produced uh, uh, as as a strict carbon chain molecule without any addendum uh, things on it uh, uh, from a chemistry standpoint. And I wish I had that graph, like I was looking at it, uh, or not the graph, the, the picture, because I was looking at it while making the presentation and I said, ah, maybe I'll just leave this out. I don't need to go into the chemistry that, that detailed, uh, but Murphy's law, of course, uh, uh, I guess in a way that uh, the thing I forgot to put in, but anyway, um, yeah, yeah, the Uinta is, is tough to operate. I mean, this is tough oil. There's not enough uh, infrastructure to get it out of the basin. The Salt Lake City refinery is full with other crudes, including some Canadian crude. So, I mean, it just doesn't make sense. But if you built enough infrastructure, I think the Uinta basin can be uh, multi hundred thousand barrels per day for sure. Not not quite a million barrels per day or anything like that, but but definitely two two hundred thousand maybe plus. Um, yeah, in the next little bit, maybe even higher, maybe maybe three four hundred thousand because the wells that Oventive is drilling is insane. Two hundred thousand barrels those wells produce in two hundred days. Um, that's that's really good <laughs> from a from a uh, call it. Um, shale like it's not really shale but but a shaley kind of decline um if you start off with that you're you're looking really good okay so last few slides here um what's changed so we've got eor we talked water flooding we talked oil basics we've reduced our footprints massively in the 1970s a 65 acre gravel pad could drill three square miles in 2016 a 12-acre gravel pad, so one-fifth the size, could drill 55 square miles. So one-fifth the size, but it can drill 20 times the mileage because of horizontal drilling, of course. Now, in just the last six years, this is what ConocoPhillips is saying they're going to do in the Willow Project in Alaska. They have a, the same 12-acre pad as of six years ago, but it's going to do 154 square miles. So three times more now uh, square miles that it can impact. Very great job done by the oil and gas industry to reduce expenses, reduce cost, reduce surface lease, reduce taxes, and also have a better, cleaner operation, which when, when I started the presentation with the Bakersfield wells, that is not a clean operation by any means. It's cool as a petroleum kind of engineer to see, uh, uh, but but... That's, that's not a clean operation at all. That's why we have the social pushback that we do in a lot of cases. Now we're able to do things much better, uh, which, which hopefully creates a more opportunity um, for less, less expensive, more acreage uh, hit kind of production in the future. This is where ConocoPhillips is drilling in the Alaska North Slope. You can see why this is a migratory bird territory. The estuaries and meandering rivers. And you can see why they want a very small pad to, uh, to get the oil out of a much larger area. This is a migratory bird area, as I said. Uh, you, you don't want to be impacting these things. And the social and environmental laws these days are not going to let you do that anyway. If you had a thousand pump jacks you wanted to put in this, in this area, like uh, 
yeah, forget about it. You're you're basically dreaming. So Conoco said they want to do five pads and uh, the government only approved three pads. The environmentalists wanted it down to two pads, but it wouldn't make economic sense at two pads. So the three pads did get approved right now uh, as far as from the federal government um, and, and what they put out. Um, and okay, so I'll just end this with a, with a couple of points here where we've come from and where we're, I've, I've made the points as to where we're going. I'll show you where we where we came from. Oil seeps in McKittrick, California. This is common in Fort McMurray. This is common in California. Heavy oil seeps when it's close to surface and there's no impermeable rock. What happens? It comes all the way to surface. Nothing is stopping it. And so I think when when people have this misconception that oil and gas is causing spills, well, it's a part of the industry. It is a, there's always going to be a chance that there's going to be spills and leaks. We do our best to, to contain them, to control them. But we had naturally occurring seeps for thousands of years. There's in, in historic uh, data, the First Nations were using these seeps for their boats and their construction and their... Uh, uh, even medicine and and kind of plants in certain cases. So uh, there's 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 lots of this out there that the oil companies are cleaning up by extracting the oil rather than letting it seep up like this naturally. In the case of Fort McMurray, it used to go into the river, uh, and it still does in certain places. Uh, this is the Lake View Gusher. This is 1910 in California. You can see a uh, very nicely dressed gentleman here posing for a picture uh, in front of what is a gushing oil well. Uh, this oil well was gushing at uh, multi tens of thousands of barrels per day. And they're standing in front of this very nice pool uh, dugout of uh, pure crude oil uh, that they're very happy because they obviously are going to make lots of money off this. This is what the industry used to look like 100 years ago. Um, Am I am I condoning this? No, that's just the times that it was back then. We have come a long, long, long way. Orders of magnitude, completely different planet in terms of the uh, the work around how we produce oil wells. We don't just let wells gush out. We don't let derricks collapse into the uh, the gusher. We don't have cr crude oil ponds like this uh, as our dugouts. We don't have any of this. So. Definitely one thing to keep in mind that the oil industry is a hundred million barrel per day industry. We're doing our very best to keep things clean, to keep things modernized, to keep things without incident. Uh, but we've come a metric planet away from what you know used to be done. Uh, so just just cool his history, I guess, where it all started, where we are today, and where we're going uh, in the future. And then to end it off, I will just share with you the oil well itself and the pool of dugout that they had created. Uh, this well in 1910 uh, produced at 125,000 barrels per day, one well. And how much did it produce? In a year and a half, it produced almost 10 million barrels of oil. This is how successful this conventional oil wells used to be. Of course, I'm talking a century ago. All this easy oil has been discovered, it's been developed, it's been produced, and it's been consumed. We are in a new era now. Do we still have some gusher potential in certain places of the world? Yes. Do we still have the very odd gusher that can be hit in North America over a decade-long period of exploration? Sure. But for the most part, we are in a mature development phase of the conventional oil and gas industry which is why we're having to go to oil sands and shale and offshore. So, you know, just one point I want to make that that the oil well productivity that we are at today uh, and the kind of technical expertise it takes to produce every last barrel of oil uh, is really an engineering marvel. And, uh, you know, maybe not everybody cares for it, but I think as investors, you know, it's just something that's cool and uh, something that we can learn more about. And, uh, agrees with the thesis that oil is getting harder to find and the best place that uh, to find oil is where it already exists. And so we go there, we put in EUR, enhanced oil recovery, 
and we produce more oil, higher recovery factors out of the fields where we already know oil exists. So with that, um, I think I'll uh, wrap it up there. Uh, appreciate everybody's, uh, um, you know, joining in today and and the and uh, being here with us for the entirety of the presentation. Um, yeah, so I don't want to talk about Bakersfield just in gen, uh, like specifically because I don't know enough about the Kern River fields, but California is sitting on an ocean of oil, both onshore and offshore, and they refuse to develop it. So. It's a good thing for the global supply demand thesis for us as oil and gas investors, uh, but Bakersfield and San Joaquin Basin and the underlying shale beneath it is so underexplored that I don't even think we're anywhere close to EOR uh, on those. So maybe I'll just put it that way. Uh, keep supply, uh, keep areas of supply where, where large supply can come online, keep them in your radar because those are the ones we want to watch that can impact our structural supply demand uh, bullish thesis here uh, going forward. So um, yeah, so I think we're four hours into this now. Um, I would love to do a little bit of Q and A, but I think uh, for the sake of, I think my uh, voice and also for everybody else's patience, we'll maybe leave the questions for one of the weekly spaces uh, or maybe the following week uh, presentations. Um, I am going to Vegas on Tuesday, so I'll be out of uh, the presentations, I guess, for about two weeks. Uh, another two weeks, I will update the schedule on the website accordingly. Uh, but I believe the next one will be so. Uh, what is it today? Twenty sixth. So, so the next one will be February or March nineteenth. Will be the next one, and I believe March eighteenth. I'm going to try and do my uh, Q four recap, uh, where we discuss some updates on all the companies. And we'll also have a junior uh, company update. So, so that'll be um, a nice little session Saturday and Sunday, which will make up for some of the gap here that we've had. Um, Cause I do love sharing some of this stuff, but uh, also I think it's a good time here uh, going into the, the rest of the year to kind of take, take a couple of weeks off, enjoy some time with, with buddies and, and family and, uh, and friends and uh, yeah, just kind of take her easy for a bit. So uh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, once again, appreciate everybody's present, uh, here, uh, uh, involvement, everybody's questions always love when people are, uh, you know, asking really nice detailed technical questions, um, uh, because I love answering them. And also, uh, it shows that people actually care to listen to, to this kind of stuff. So, uh, thanks again. And, uh, I bid you in, uh, adios here till, uh, the next time we see you on, on either a space or on a, um, or on the next Sunday presentation here. Cheers.